Hey everybody, today we're debating whether or not Black Lives Matter does more harm than good, and we are starting right now with Yurnas' opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Yurnas. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, James. Thanks for having me on the channel, and thanks for hosting the debate. Uh, we're going to be talking about if BLM has done more harm than good. In my view, they have, more, have done more harm than good, and I'll tell you from my perspective as a political scientist. So... Let's say I was someone who was convinced there was institutionalized racism. Let's say I believed that black men were shot in the streets for no reason by racist white cops. Let's say I wanted to get people to believe me and go along with me to change policy in order to end these terrible practices. What would I do if I had two brain cells? I would look for instances where this happened, and then I would use the media to amplify that sound and make people see that I am right. Well, the thing is that BLM has done all of the opposites of what I just described. So that makes me very uh, skeptical of their intentions and if of the truth behind their so-called convictions. They present themselves as a Marxist organization. They don't seek to look for any common ground. And most of the instances they've used to amplify their sound have been proven to be led by a false narrative. You can go from the uh, Ferguson case to uh, the, I was the one called, uh, Bryant case. Uh, there are so many cases where they lied about a lot of the instances. They lied about how the police operated. They lie about their statistics. That makes me very skeptical about this organization. I'm myself a uh, mixed race from Suriname. I am black. I would not want black people to be shot for no reason. Obviously, you don't need to be black to think that. I'm just giving you my perspective. I actually feel really bad because I'm a right winger. I'm a capitalist. I like Ayn Rand. But I would actually support BLM if they were correct. If they could show me the numbers, if they would use cases that were truthful, I would still support them, even though I'm a capitalist and they say they are Marxist. If they would have been right on the policy, I would have defended them. But now it's impossible for me to do that. And that puts me in a very difficult spot because I don't want black people to be shot. And this is just one example. I'm just one person. But imagine this for black people all over the world. They have done no more harm than good. They have made the message not reliable. They have put a shame on the name of what black people say, like, if black people now talk about someone got shot for no reason, I'm going to be skeptical, let alone white people who have more reason to be skeptical. So that's why they've done so much more harm than good. And I'm not even talking about the riots and the lighting up parts of cities. I don't even want to talk about that. I'm just talking about how they want to change policy and what they did to achieve that goal. They were technically wrong, and that makes their whole case very unreliable. And that's a shame if you believe that what they say is the truth. So I would say that even if you're a left winger or whatever and you fully support their goals, you should be disappointed by what BLM has done because they have used the wrong instances to amplify this sound. So either they are stupid or they have another agenda. Doesn't matter. It's not good for black people. It's not good for all of society. That goes for America and it goes for Europe because believe me, we have some of these same trends popping up here. The George Floyd thing was also a big media cycle over here. So it affects the whole world if they lie about black people being shot in the streets for no reason in America. So that's why I oppose them. They poison the debate, which is a debate we should be having because there are cores of truth in some of the things they say, like maybe we should be using body cams, maybe the police should be trained better, things I'm open to. But they poison the debate by making it about race and then being wrong about the instances. I think I've made myself clear. You got it. Thank you very much, Yurnas. We are thrilled to have you here. And want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Debate, we are thrilled you are here. No matter what walk of life you are from, Christian, atheist, politically left, politically right, gay, straight, black, white, you name it. We're thrilled to have you here as we are a neutral debate platform hosting debates. And if you haven't heard, we are doing a 12-hour debate stream today, folks. This is going to be epic. So we are absolutely thrilled for this and we are thankful for our guests we are going to kick it over to brenton for his opening statement as well thanks so much for being with us the floor is all yours you want to know what this is really all about the nixon campaign in 1968 and the nixon white house after that had two enemies the anti-war left and black people 
We knew we couldn't make it be illegal to be either against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Those are the words of John Ehrlichman, President Nixon's top aide on domestic affairs. Now, you may wonder why I'm quoting him being that the Nixon administration ended 46 to 47 years ago. However, as we're all learning, the cruel, capricious, and downright malicious actions of our government have serious repercussions on our society and endure long after the evil men who first carried them out are long gone. According to the Drug Policy Alliance, the United States today spends an estimated $51 billion on the exact same war on drugs. Things got worse under President Ronald Reagan, who massively expanded Nixon's war on black people and shifted the focus on criminal punishment to, to criminal punishment over treatment. This led to a massive increase in incarcerations fueled by the crack epidemic that arose in the early 1980s. Congress quickly established a series of mandatory minimum prison sentences for various drug offenses, a notable feature of which was the massive gap between the amounts of crack cocaine, which is associated with black users, and powder cocaine, which is associated with whites. Possession of five Five grams of crack led to an automatic five-year sentence, while it took the possession of 500 grams of powder cocaine to trigger the same sentence. It is important to note that these are the exact same drug and do exactly the same thing. And to this day, there is a, an unproven but still nonetheless strong suspicion among many in the Black community that crack was first introduced to them by the CIA, an accusation which is at least somewhat credible, as the CIA has been proven to have been involved in the international trafficking and sale of cocaine during the same period. So in short, we may not have proof, but we have motive, we have opportunity, and we have means. Whatever the cause, these policies led directly to the rise of private for-profit prison systems, which Reagan, as a true believer in neoliberal capitalism and the privatization of government services, was only too happy to fill at a guaranteed 90% occupancy rate. Things only got worse when a Democrat got into power. Under the Clinton crime bill of the 90s, incarceration rates soared, cheered on by the likes of Hillary Clinton, who famously referred to young black men as psychotic super predators. Today, um, similar occupancy guarantees continue in virtually every state in the union, which means if they can't find criminals to fill that 90% occupancy rate, they find criminals to, find that, to fill the 90% occupancy rate. As the number of prisoners exploded, the black community in the United States soon found that nearly one third of their entire male population would spend some of their lifetime in these new for-profit beds, whether they were, whether they were innocent or guilty. When, com when combined with the fact that whites are as likely, if not more likely, to commit drug crimes than people of color, the issue becomes very clear. And I can only echo the words of Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Era of, Colorblind in an era of Colorblindness, when I say, the primary targets of the penal system's control can largely be defined by race. And I might add, not just any race, but one specific race, bringing about a state of affairs today that she described as, quote, Quote, a racial caste system strikingly similar to the Jim Crow South. Americans, despite making up 4.4% of the world's population, have roughly 22% of the world's prisoners. That's more than were held in Stalin's gulags. And for all of our talk about China's creeping authoritarianism and lack of respect for human rights, we imprison our own people at nearly six times the rate of the People's Republic of China. And despite blacks making up only 13% of our population, they make up the largest chunk, 34% of our male prison population where they are, of course, put to work, earning literal pennies a day, staffing call centers and manufacturing thousands of consumer products from stereo equipment to military flak jackets. If you see made in America on a product, odds are that product was made by a prisoner and odds are that prisoner was black. Now, you may say, but, but, but Brent, they deserve it. They broke the law. Blacks commit the most crime. And if you have been affected, like so many have, uh, by literal neo-Nazi propaganda based on a complete inability to read or understand statistics, you might quote to me some version of 1350. They're 13% of the population, but they commit 50% of the violent crime. And if you are particularly ignorant of the scientific consensus on this issue, you might even say that when blacks are killed by law enforcement, they are killed in proper proportion to the violent crime that they commit. But this is simply not the case. To, to quote Nature Journal, the most cited and respected scientific journal in the Western world, quote, 
black people fatally shot by police were twice as likely as white people to be unarmed. These findings align with many studies published since 2015, suggesting that racial biases do influence police shootings. And in a study conducted by economists at Texas A&M, evaluating 200 million 911 calls, white officers dispatched to black neighborhoods fired their guns five times as often as black officers dispatched for similar calls to the same neighborhoods. Now, you could say that this is not a race issue, that this is a class issue, because of course, when you control for poverty, poor whites and poor blacks commit violent crime at roughly the same rate, which is of course true. And there is a 350% increase in the likelihood of police killings in areas that suffer from high poverty. According to the Bureau of Justice and Statistics, poor urban blacks have rates of violence similar to poor urban whites. And there is no significant change in the crime rate when you move from rural to urban. Which, is, which of course makes sense. Poor people live in a pressure cooker. And when you put people in a pressure cooker, they are going to act out. You can be mad about that. And you can wag your finger and say that shouldn't be, but that's reality and you need to deal with it. People who do not feel represented by the system that governs them feel no need to follow the laws or customs of that system, nor should they. What's in it for them? However, when controlling for poverty, class differences account for more than 100% of the difference between white and Latino police killing rates, meaning that after adjusting for socioeconomic differences, Latinos actually have a lower rate of police killing than whites. On the other hand, class differences account for only 28% of the differences between black and white police killing rates. So we objectively cannot chalk the increased police killing rates up to poverty alone, nor can we chalk them up to an increased crime rate because again, these rates in their proper context are roughly equal. Oftentimes when people don't think very deeply about race, they imagine that the race itself prompts the behavior, uh, which is to say the state views people of color as inherently unruly because they are inherently unruly, but this is simply not the case. Um, we usually think about race in terms of skin color and facial features, but this is to miss the forest for the trees. In her book, Towards a Political Philosophy of Race, Dr. Falguni Sheth of Emory University puts forth the idea that race, as we currently understand and practice it, is a construct of sovereign power, which is to say those who are in charge in a given society are the ones who create race. Um, these are the people whose property the state is primarily interested in protecting. And protecting from who? Well, from you and me, and especially those populations that are perceived to be unruly. In the words of Cersei Lannister, anyone who isn't us. Now, you'll note that I've said perceived, and that's an important word, so, so pay attention. Populations that are perceived to be unruly by the, by the state are targeted by the state. The state cannot definitively know who is unruly and who is not until they act, just like the state cannot distinguish from someone who's white and someone who's black but looks white enough to pass. It's not about what you really are. It's about what a cop or a judge thinks you are. So if sovereign power thinks that you are unruly, well, mister, you better watch your step and stop being so unruly. So when you assign a behavior or a propensity for a behavior to a race, you are putting the cart before the horse. The reason the state views them as unruly is because it is extremely convenient to view this particular group as unruly because they look different. And since oftentimes people who look different come from very far away or have been subject to intense institutional abuse in the past, uh, they tend to not have access to valuable property and tend to be underrepresented within the elite ruling class for whom the state deploys its violence. In short, this uh, misperception becomes a vicious cycle. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes racism. And it leads us to moments like we had last summer. Now, this is a disturbing thought. It is much more comforting to imagine that our social institutions are, on average, functional, that important distinctions and decisions like who should be let into the country, who should live where, how much they should be paid for their work, and whether or not they should go to jail or be deprived of their possessions or their life are being made for good and sensible reasons. But you heard John Ehrlichman on the position of the Nixon administration. Obviously, humanity, America, and human culture is a work in progress. So what's the answer here? How do we solve this problem? How do we fix the society that from its very inception was in part purposefully designed by stupid, cruel, and downright evil men, men like Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and Bill Clinton, stretching all the way back to the founding of us as a nation? Um, a nation that I might remind everyone here was built on the purposeful extermination of one race and the enslavement of another. That's certainly something I asked myself after the police killed Eric Garner, prompting the very first Black Lives Matter march in NYC. 
I asked it as I watched Bloomberg stop and frisk, harass more Black and Latino men in New York City than the total population of all Black and Latino men in New York City. I asked it as I listened to a recording of cops threatening to break a Black teenager's arm for, quote, being an effing mutt. And I'm the one censoring there. The cop said the full word. Just a short distance from my own doorstep in Harlem. I asked it last summer as riots swept the nation, a powder keg ignited by the murder of George Floyd by thankfully former police officer Derek Chauvin, and I'm asking it now. The first step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. We cannot afford to be cowardly. We must admit that, that, uh, that this society does indeed undervalue black lives, and we must take steps to remedy that situation. No justice, no peace can also be read as no justice, no peace, K-N-O-W, as in when true justice is brought about, then and only then will peace reign. And that is why I support Black Lives Matter and have put my body and freedom on the line for them more than once. And that's why you should too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenton, for that opening statement. Folks, wanna let you know, we are absolutely pumped this is a 12-hour stream, and tonight, oh baby, you don't want to miss it, T-Jump and Nathan Thompson will be debating the shape of the Earth. So we're finally going to get our answer on that topic. And also want to remind you that our guests for each debate are linked in the description. That includes both Brenton and your Nas. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. And, oh, folks, if you're listening to the Modern Day Debate podcast, you can also find our links of our guests in the description box for that podcast episode as well. And so, gentlemen, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Yeah, I, I want to respond, but a lot of it didn't really address BLM. So, like, I can pick out some things that might relate to BLM. But so, so may, it may, didn't seem to address BLM directly, directly. because what I'm yeah. dealing with here is I'm dealing with a history that people are ignorant of. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that BLM is just the latest in a number of movements that have been uh, created in the United States by the Black community and by people interested in protecting the Black community, um, to sp specifically to respond to a malicious government targeting of Black people okay. for the purposes of profit. Can so, I ask you one? Can mm -hmm. I ask you one question? Sure. Okay. Let's say I go along with you. I believe all the things you just said. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it make sense that you would pick out cases that are really strong, like cases that could really convert someone, that if someone was like, police are not killing black people, if you showed them this case, they'd be like, wow, the police just ran up and shot this black guy out of nowhere. Like, you would pick that case, right? You wouldn't pick a case where... There's no real evidence the, of racism. Well, ha the hang guy, on, hang on. But like, they do. You know what they, what, what, the thing is, is that every one of the major cases is like that. A, a great example would be. Give um, me one. Okay, well, Freddie Gray, for instance. Freddie Gray was completely. <laughs> yeah. Freddie Gray was completely harmless. He was put into a freaking police um, paddy wagon and they did donuts in the parking lot like until they severed his spine and he died as a direct result of his encounter with the police. Okay, so, okay. Mm -hmm. But first, I don't think there was evidence of racism. There was obviously evidence of perceived police brutality. And I think the officers were punished, right? Like, okay, I, so, don't, I don't No, the officers anyone... were not punished. They got off okay. scot-free. Okay, and, and then, and then you've also got Eric Garner. Eric Garner okay, in New York. Better one. Um, once again, well, no, no, not better because you know his spine wasn't severed no, like Freddie Gray's. Freddie Gray's is not better, but yeah. yeah. But like Eric Garner in New York, which prompted the very first Black Lives Matter march, which I attended. Again, he was choked to death for selling cigarettes. No, th this is a, a wild exaggeration of how things went down. Dude, I've seen the you, video. No, no, no. Listen, video doesn't tell you everything, my man. This is Nothing what tells you everything. So what, what's right, your we, version we of it? Okay. To cut it? We might have Can to break it into three yeah. minute intervals if we if we don't have a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll... Okay. So what happened with Eric Gardner is he did something illegal. Like we both agree it probably shouldn't be illegal, but it is illegal what he did. The police came up to him. He resisted arrest, taking a big risk. He had like uh, he had a condition, and the chokehold they put on him, they have put on hundreds of people. And this has never happened before. So you can still say it's police brutality. You can still make the case the police shouldn't use a chokehold. But to say this is evidence of racism, 
it just doesn't fly, my guy. Like, please, just give me an example where it's really racism and I support you. Why does it always have to be people who resist arrest, who do illegal stuff, who have like... Uh, what do you define as racism? That, ...that make them die? Come on, man. Give me a good what, what, case. What do you design... What do you define as racism? I, I want to hear this because I, I'm, I'm very... In this context, in mm -hmm. the context of police versus citizen... I would say it's racist if a police officer treats a citizen differently, i.e. worse, because of the color of their skin. And you don't think that the police officers put him in a chokehold because he was black? He was black. They saw him no. as inherently more violent. Because we know that they do that because, again, I had in my opening statement, they are five times more likely to deploy their guns in neighborhoods if it's a white officer. So statistically speaking, objectively speaking, they will treat black people worse than white people who commit the same crime. They do it. Judges do it. Um, well, it but you it, say that yeah. has to do with their environment. You have to say it has to do with the area it's in, so not their color. Well, it has to do with the both area the area. No, it has to do with both the area they're in and yeah. their color. And they're in that area a lot of time because of their color. Because first in the United States, black people were here as a captive um, enslaved workforce. Then after they were freed by the Civil War, they were left without property, uh, without backing. And then they were subjected to like decades and decades of Jim Crow abuse. And then they were su subjected to, even after the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1968, continued implicit um, abuse. And then, the, then one third of their um, one third of their men were put in prison specifically at 90% guaranteed occupancy rates to exploit okay, their well, labor. Can we, get back to Eric, yeah. can we get back to Eric, can we get back to the Eric Garner case? Sure. But we, the thing is, is that we can't see Eric Gar the Eric Garner case as a single isolated incident with no other factors leading up to it. The very fact that he was there selling loose cigarettes, breaking the law. You know, the, the fact that he was there is because of these uh, past economic and political abuses by the state. He might have been a, a he might have, well, I, this would be worse than selling raw cigarettes. He might have been a Wall Street Can I, can I ask, he another, can I ask another question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think the officer, who, I think he was black, actually, who choked out Eric Garner and the police officer he was who white. was black, do you think... That that officer was racist, yes or no? Do you have any evidence it, for that? Any reason to believe it? It doesn't matter because I don't care about what a person is deep so down no. in their heart. No. So look, no. Look, think about it like this. Think about it like this. If someone steals your wallet, do you care if deep down in their heart they consider themselves a thief or do you just want your wallet back? Well, I obviously want my wallet back. But okay. That, so in, in any case. Like, so I I don't care. If deep down in that officer's heart, he is a racist or not, he's not going to be my best man at my wedding. He's not coming in and he's not going to rent an apartment with me. I'm not going to have to deal with him on that. What I care about is, did he do a racist action? And choking Eric Garner to death was a race, was a racist action, just like putting Freddie Gray in the back of the freaking paddy wagon and running uh, uh, donuts until his spine severed. That was a racist action, just like Derek Chauvin putting his knee on the neck uh, of George Floyd until he freaking died. That is a racist action. And what this is a racist. Saying? All of this stuff uh, comes from a long line of awful police history and awful police uh, policy towards community of colors that is buoyed by the fact that laws are written and enforced by the state specifically okay. to target we, them. If, if I could talk to, now for, hold a, on for a second, second. I'm, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm jumping in here to mention that we aren't, it's not clear, given how much time we've used already, that we're addressing whether or not Black Lives Matter in particular has done more harm than good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we might want to gravitate in that direction. So, yeah. Right. But I will point out, James, this is really important because what I'm hearing from Yanaz is that um, Black Lives Matter is responding to incidents that are not racist. And the major incidents well, of Black provable. Lives Matter. Are I'm they sorry, can't what? prove it. They can't can, prove well, it. It's yeah, racism. Hold on. A second. If you okay. are. Gentlemen, but regardless of like whether mm -hmm. or not like there is actual like the debate nonetheless has been about whether or not there is this type of racism versus police brutality or both. And like even granting that there is whether or not black lives matter is like done good or bad mm -hmm. in regards to that like there's that's like more of what we're looking for sure I yeah mean, so if i if i could yeah, you, if i could have the floor like mm -hmm. the thing i'm getting at is 
if you want to convince me of something, you have to give me the evidence. If you're telling me it's very hard to prove racism because we can't look into people's hearts, okay, maybe BLM should have focused on the police brutality side because that seems to be way easier to prove. But that's so like why... BLM's whole thing. That was their primary no, no, thing no. from the very their beginning. Point, <laughs> their point is specifically that black people are targeted more proportionally than other people. So because that's why they are. I'm looking at the claim <laughs> and the claim is weak. So if the claim that the police do bad things is a better claim, run with that claim. Okay. Like don't, don't, don't trouble the well, don't poison the well with claiming that officers are racist while we both don't even know if they are and you don't seem to care if they are. Just talk about the brutality and I probably agree if you have evidence. So first off, what's really important here is to understand that there are two kinds of racism. There is the kind of racism that a lot of us were raised uh, being taught about, which is having negative feelings towards another human being because of their race. And usually that's even, Obviously. yeah, that, that type of personal racism is not the most dangerous. And that's not even necessarily what Black Lives Matter is dealing with. The issues that Black Lives Matter is, is dealing with first is police killings. Uh, and I want to make that very clear. Police killings of black men. That was their primary thing from the very beginning. That's what set off the whole thing. But also um, just the system itself and how the inhuman system the machine of people that is the state, that is the justice system in the United States, is set up even if the person is not racist, if they are acting as a, pol as a police officer and enforcing racist laws created by racists, they are in effect doing racism. And that type is much more insidious and more pernicious. Now, a, a good example of this that I might give you is, is Freddie Gray. Now, again, okay. Freddie Gray was raised, are you familiar, you're not from the States, so are you familiar with redlining? Yeah, I know what it is, yeah. Okay, so Freddie Gray was raised in a, an illegal redline department that was run by a slumlord, and they kept um, uh, lead paint on the walls, even though it was illegal. So Freddie Gray, as a child, ate those paint chips, like many children do. And as a result, he was brain damaged. Now, as a direct result of being brain damaged, one of the symptoms of being poisoned by lead is uh, an inability to think properly, uh, to behave in an overly aggressive manner. And uh, people who are poisoned by this, oftentimes they don't go to college, they can't hold down a job, et cetera. Now it was proved that he was poisoned by that lead and he even won a case. He and his sisters all won a, a lot of money uh, from, based upon, like from the property management corporation based upon that poisoning as a child. But the thing is, is that because he was brain damaged, he was tricked out of that money by uh, unscrupulous lawyers who tricked him into taking a smaller lump sum payment to take what was rightfully his and his sisters. And the, the, it happens every day, again, because these people are not educated, they are brain damaged. Um, and I'm talking specifically about people like raised in um, that kind of environment. All of this led to the perfect storm that eventually led to him having that run in with the cops uh, and then eventually getting his spine severed. Um, similarly, like Ferguson, a, a great example of this is that you want to talk about Michael Brown because that was the first nonsense case. They I'm not talking. So Michael Brown is, is immaterial because there's a, a thousand Michael Browns. No, no, no. Hold up, hold up. It's not mm -hmm. immaterial because in your introduction you used the word unarmed. Michael Brown was unarmed, but he was unarmed yeah. when he tried to grab a gun of a police officer. That's okay. So first off, that's first okay off, because he was unarmed. It's still a killing. Yeah. So first like, off, that's like the the most basic lie police officers tell when they want to get a hold of somebody. It's, they think they saw a gun. They think the guy's resisting. No, no, no. He I, didn't I, say he saw a gun. He yeah. grabbed his gun. That's what. Yeah, he, said. I, he said he grabbed his gun. Now the thing is, is that I have actually been arrested. I was arrested with Occupy Wall Street. And when okay, the police officers more, grabbed me, you guys, we do I was have to talk about BLM soon. Yeah. Like, this yeah. is like. No, the, the point here is, is that police officers lie all the damn time. This isn't we about know police they officers, lie. so we do want to bring it back to BLM. <laughs> okay, well, with BLM, the BLM's primary <laughs> core issue, beyond all of the other issues that they talk about, is police violence and police killings of black men by officers. And you're not, you're taking the police officers at their word when you really can't. No, no. Mm hmm the, the, the whole like I, I researched the Michael Brown case and it kickstarted a lot of BLM. So the fact that that was a lie is very important. No, it's together actually with, not. Yeah, because together first, with okay, Michael Brown, we, we didn't set Zimmerman. up a debate on police brutality. Mm -hmm. So we, we okay. have, like you know, you're talking about Michael Brown, like 
It was Michael Brown and BLM. Right. Uh, I, like, I, we got to go back to the main subject here. Okay, so well, James, I just want main... to re recognize here that his main point against BLM is that the big cases that BLM has used, George Floyd, um, Freddie Gray, Michael uh, Brown, Eric Garner, he's saying they're all lies, which is just not the case. Most of them. And so, we so, okay, yeah. that's helpful. We're saying most of them are lies. The context. So folks in the chat who are trying to make the connection, it wasn't clear to me as well, but I, I get what you're saying now. So your NAS, uh, your NAS yeah. is saying that BLM has made things worse by, according to your NAS, by allegedly, basically uh, spreading misinformation. Basing so, it on cases that are, yeah. Okay, which, gotcha. which is yeah, sorry, so, guys. So again, that's my fault. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I, like, I agree with the Freddie Gray one, and I mm -hmm. agree with Philando Castile. Okay. And I have never seen any right winger say those two cases were great. I've but seen most of the other cases, from Michael Brown to Garner to the last one with the guy with the knife, there are so many lies surrounding it, and so much racism is being invented to make it amp to amplify their sound. That makes me skeptical, and I don't know why someone who has good intentions, who really wants to do something about police brutality, would would. Like go along with all these lies just because you believe their core point. So like they're, they're not, using you. One, using one, you. one. I'm going to point out that they're not lies. I mean, freaking um, the the woman in uh, Louisville. Um, uh, I can't remember her name. She was sh she was shot while sleeping in her bed on a Brianna fake, Taylor. Like, yeah, Brianna Taylor. Thank you. She was shot while sleeping in her bed. How can you say that's not racist? Okay, you want to talk about that case? They no, didn't shoot the thing, people at her. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. Her boyfriend shot at the cops, and the sh the cops shot. No, back. no, they no. The cops the cops broke into the home on a no knock raid, and yes, he did have a gun. Uh, I do not believe that he, he fired shot at the police them. officers. But even if he One did side. shoot at them, he was perfectly justified in shooting at them because it was a no knock raid. He didn't know who they were. They didn't announce themselves. So okay. one hundred percent, the fact that they targeted her. Um, no, they they targeted him. They didn't target no, her. No, it had no. It they was a, hit her. They didn't was, mean to hit her. They did not. Come on. So you've got a guy shooting a gun. At, no, hang on, hang on. We're going to get into the weeds here on this, and I don't want to do it, especially since people haven't uh, fully made this connection. You're presenting it as if the cops wanted to kill her. We it do doesn't matter if the cops wanted to kill her to Brandon, or not. And then I promise we'll come back and give you a couple min minutes. Look, or not. Okay. You keep using a certain phrase called poisoning the well. And this is important here because poisoning the well is literally a, a fallacy. You, so let's take your, your logic that Black Lives Matter has used bad examples. Okay, let's pretend that that's the case. It's not the case. It 100% okay. is not the case, but let's pretend it is. Um, what you are doing here is even if Black Lives Matter has used bad examples that you don't think personally are good examples of racism, the fact of the matter is, is that statistically they are still right. And therefore, it is a fallacy to say this time they were wrong, and therefore what they talk about is not important. Every single example that Black Lives Matter uses could be a lie, and it, they would still be correct because we have the statistical evidence to prove it. You so cannot be an effective political I say organization about another minute. My, if another you lie minute less, about less, Hold on, you're not. Cases. Less, well, we know that they're, we know that they're an effective back. political organization, though. James, we, we know that they're an effective political organization. I have seen things go in the United States from people uh, equating like Black Lives Matter with the KKK to Black Lives Matter being one of the biggest and most powerful forces in American politics to seeing uh, politicians taking the knee here in the United States. And that is specifically because Black Lives Matter has been incredibly effective at getting this out. So even if I were to take your premise that they got it out all based on a lie, it doesn't matter. Because the, the, the problem that they are pointing out is real. For instance, um, black men are seven times more likely to be falsely convicted of murder than white men, at least seven times more likely. Again, statistical fact. So at the, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the seconds. police treat black people worse than white people. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the police kill more black people out of proportion to what they uh, to their um, their population. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the criminal justice system within the United States is set up to imprison black people and exploit them for their labor, whether they are guilty or not. All right. And so if we all are of going this to jump through, to your ass for about three all... minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. That is the crazy thing. Like the crazy thing is that if you were right, 
they would have so many cases to choose from. There would have been like every day there would be a black guy just shot in his house by the cops. Like you, you, yes. the case you're making, you're making it even worse. You're saying there are so many cases of black people being killed for no reason. That makes it worse that they pick the, 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 the least good ones. Like yes, you're you even are making it look no. worse. Like, like my point is there are not enough cases and that's why they're lying. You're saying there are so many cases and still they only pick the bad ones. Like, not saying dude, that. it's the own goal. Like, dude, I am not saying that. I'm saying now. pick some of the strongest ones out there. And I'm... I'm are these really the strongest one? So the strongest one they have is, is uh, George Floyd, where we have no evidence of racism from Chauvin. The, like, no that's evidence. the best case they have. The hang on, hang on. What would, you, what would you take as, as evidence of racism from Chauvin? I don't know, maybe something in his history. Maybe he used the N-word around people. I, give me something. Like, okay. give me something to hang on to. So, don't first just off, give me the knee and have me assume that he's a racist. First off, you Chauvin, gotta was, give me more. Yeah, Chauvin was known for attacking, uh, for attacking people, and particularly for attacking black people. And they tried to get rid of him. They tried to fire him like four different times. But the police unions in the United States are so strong, it makes it impossible to do that. That's why people talk about defund and abolish the police. It's not because they don't want someone in, in like patrolling their neighborhood. It's not because they don't want police. It's because it is impossible to reform the police as long as the police unions hold this stranglehold that keeps psychopathic people, psychopathic racist people like Chauvin from ever seeing any consequences okay. until it gets this bad. Point of agreement. If you want to get rid of qualified immunity, I think police labor unions are way too strong. I'm a libertarian. We can agree on it. But you still really like convince me more because i want to be convinced if it's true because if it's true it's the worst thing ever and we should really stop it but mm -hmm. like talk to your people at blm and ask them please be a little bit more critical which cases you're going to bring to the forefront look, because the better they are the stronger we could use it I don't to convince see, people I, look i don't even see how you can say that chauvin is a bad is a case chauvin was convicted of murder like proven in a state in a court, almost impossible to do that with a cop, except for absolutely overwhelming evidence that he murdered George Floyd for no good reason. I think you and me can both agree that just like the OJ case, this was a very tense one. I'm not going to say uh, well, they didn't so, think about it correctly, but like it's going to be hard to put this. Okay, really well, 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 case. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just brought up the OJ case. I wasn't going to bring that up, but I'm, I'm going to point out that you said it, it would be evidence if they said the N-word, well, freaking um, Mark Furman was like a, a freaking neo-Nazi who said the N-word. Yeah, so you're saying that even in the OJ case, they had better evidence and everyone knew that was bullshit. He was still guilty. But even then, they had better evidence. They at least well, had wait, a wait, hang on. The OJ the case was about, was about whether or not OJ Simpson was guilty or not. Yeah, he I got away with it that. because <laughs> in the United States, if you're rich, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but, no, no, I got you. Yeah, yeah. but... but the, the point is, is that right there, there was also, he was guilty and the police system was racist and was trying to set him up. Mark Furman specifically was trying to set him up and plant evidence. And we have evidence that he was racist. So this, yeah. So, I'm, so, so, yeah. so, so, so why, why put that, that as a, mm -hmm. well, the point is that even in the OJ case, even though he was guilty, they had stronger evidence of police being racist than in the George Floyd case. Um, That's I, crazy to me. One That's crazy to well, me. Well, again, the thing is, is that they did have very strong evidence that Chauvin was racist. You were having, there's two It didn't came up in the court case, man. It didn't yeah, came up in the court there, case. There are two issues that you're having here. One, I think you've got a, a certain degree of ignorance going on about these cases, specifically because I, I my, what I'm going off on, I think you're just listening to right-wing sources that are specifically trying to disprove <laughs> this. Now, honestly, that, man, I, I, I watch too many, too much Young Turk that then my health can handle. So oh God, well, I'm really <laughs> into left wing stuff because I want to yeah. know how you guys talk. So, oh, OK, but then if you were really into left wing stuff, how did you not know about Freddie Gray? No, I knew about Freddie Gray and I never argued the Freddie Gray case. I never mm -hmm. said the cops handled correctly in that case. I'm not saying there is no police brutality. I'm not saying there are not cases that BLM could use to amplify their sound that are way better than the George Floyd and the Gardner case. Okay, That's so my the, basic point of criticism. So, so I don't think they use the right cases. So essentially, you, you're saying that, if I'm right here, you're saying... but. We already have objective evidence that 
um, the systemic murder and the systemic uh, imprisonment of black men by bad actors within the United States government is happening. We know that that's happening, right? So your, your, your quibble here is you don't like the cases that have specifically been elevated and dealt with by BLM. But here's the other thing. BLM isn't the only force that is elevating those cases. The media is what elevates those cases. There are, so if, if we look at Eric mm. Garner, for instance, um, you know that was elevated and BLM took that on and kind of rose out of that because we had it on, we had on video a guy who was nonviolent being choked to death. We saw a freaking snuff film on on video recorded we saw everything he um, didn't intend to joke him right it, it, they come on they lie about that all the time you've got to understand that when i was absolutely ragdoll at, at occupy wall street being held by the, the freaking cops i was kneed in the spine i was thrown into all a right, motorcycle more, and the guy who was going BLM. after me was yelling stop yeah. resisting stop resisting yeah. stop resisting cops lie if we go back and to the BLM thing is, more. Yeah. Okay, but this is important because what he, what's happening here is he's taking cops' testimony at face value. When when the, when the fact is is that they are no more. I'd say they are less likely to be honest than the average person, particularly in cases where they have been violent. I think people. Are, I, I just don't really want, see people are more wanting an explanation from either or both of you on how this ties back to BLM itself. OK, so BLM, how this ties back to BLM, the organization, and, and maybe we should get off of this point and move on to another one. Um, nice. But like BLM, the organization is a like they take cases that have already caught fire and they bring them to the forefront. Now, there's important stuff, for instance, with regard to the Ferguson case. It's an, there's there's a very good reason even though they didn't 100% have a choice in what the, that was going to be about with regard to, um, uh, you know, there's so many of these, I get their names all confused, Michael Brown. Um, the Ferguson police were found by the Trump's own Justice Department to be using dogs, like police dogs, exclusively to intimidate and terrify only black people. Only black people, no, no possible white people were, were threatened with a dog. And this goes back to the fact that the Ferguson Police Department was founded as a slave catching organization. And after the Civil War, moved from slave catching to, um, uh, to, to general policing. And this is actually how every single police precinct in the South, with maybe one or two exceptions, was founded. They were all founded as explicitly racist organizations. And one of the tactics that were used by slave patrols was to go after slaves with dogs because they were so terrifying. And so the fact of the matter is, is that if you've got a police department that the only thing that they're doing is targeting black people with dogs, you have proof that that police department is racist beyond, beyond the shadow of a doubt, whether the individual officers are or not. Um, so how does this tie into BLM? I think Michael Brown was a really good example. And the fact of the matter is, is even if he, even if there are issues in that case and you don't believe that, and you believe that that shooting and killing of him was justified, the fact that they focused on him, which gave national focus to Ferguson, which then led the Trump administration, the Trump administration to investigate them and find this link that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that they are racist. That shows me that BLM is doing a really good job of getting this stuff out into the public consciousness in a way that it simply couldn't before because you know i okay. was, i didn't know about that stuff so okay if i could respond earlier mm -hmm. on you talked about the media i fully agree the media played a major role in this but that's why if blm is sort of a gatekeeper a sort of like a checking organization then they should look at what the media puts out and then judge if the media was right or wrong and if they were a better organization they would have said you know what the Michael Brown case, not really great because it seems like all the evidence points to him attacking the cop. So, yeah, he was unarmed, but we don't want to lie to the people. Let's pick a case where the guy was really unarmed and there's no evidence of him trying to steal the gun. I think we could convince way more people when we say that. So the you're thing right is, is it doesn't matter. Yeah, th this is the you're thing. You're right though. about the media, mm -hmm. but okay. BLM but, but, should still be a better organization if they want to be trustworthy. And if you can see the national polls in the US, the support for BLM is going down. It's well, yes, but also that's because of the riots yeah. over the past summer. But also, definitely. Yeah. We yeah. haven't even come to the riots. But well, yeah, th this is the right. thing though, because you're misunderstanding, like, have you ever been in a street protest? Uh, I've seen them. I don't Okay, yeah, so you this. haven't been in one. Okay, this is important. So this is really key. You are acting like 
the riots that occurred were commanded by BLM, that every street protest was Black Lives Matter and that Black Lives Matter had control and marching orders over these people who were in the streets who then rioted. That's not the case. Riots are like, like an, almost like a natural disaster. It's like a hurricane. It come, you know, people don't get together and say, hey, we're going to riot. Like sometimes they'll, they'll get together and they'll try to start a riot, which is, by the way, illegal. Um, but the fact that a riot actually happens is not something that any one person or okay. any group can, can control. If, it if, just happens. If I, if I would take your word that BLM had no intention of there being riots in black neighborhoods and setting people's houses on fire and their stores, okay, you know what could have happened? There could have been like one riot with Antifa stirring shit up. And then the second that happened, BLM could have said, you know what? We have nothing to do with this. We care about the police brutality. Anyone who lights something on fire, don't ever use our name. Like they could have denounced so, it. They could have said, arrest Antifa. Like if they were an honest organization that hated riots and didn't want to ruin black people's property, they could have said, Antifa, get the hell out. You are a bunch of racists if you light our houses on fire. They could have So I will, that I will quote didn't. Martin Luther King here. A riot is the, the cry quote, of the unheard. I know the quote. Martin yeah. Luther King was maybe right then, but he ain't right now. And he, maybe he wouldn't have said it now. Uh, okay. The riots of the wow. unheard, the language of the unheard stuff, right? Yeah. I know it. Yeah. Like, yeah. So oh, basically, you're saying riots are good, right? No. Yeah. Riot. I'm saying riots are. Riots exist when you take a population like that and you put them in a pressure cooker. You're going to get riots. It's just going no, to happen. Man, you know. You know what? Yeah. You know what? As, as I have seen from the beginning of this debate, you are very deterministic. Like you don't seem to believe in free will. <laughs> like you keep saying stuff like when people are poor, they're going to commit crimes. When people do no. this, they're going to riot. Like stuff happens if you put this and this together. No, people make decisions. People for, for, make choices. For, people for the record. For the people record. weigh what they want to do. Like people make choices. Come on, dude. Yeah. For the record, I'm the furthest thing from a determinist. Um, in fact, I've been Good wanting there. to argue against a determinism on this uh, on this very platform, to tell you the truth. But okay. my my point is is that of all of the choices that people could make systems will incentivize certain choices by uh, either in, 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 on purpose or by accident as externalities. When you take a population and you imprison, say, one third of the men in that population, um, what's going to happen is, is there is going to be an effect from that. You have incentivized a certain number of choices for those men when they come out. So for instance, you say you're 17, like the guy in my neighborhood who got stop and frisked. You've been harassed by the police your entire life. They, they corner you in the other way. They make fun of your dad for just being a traffic cop, not being a real cop. And they tell you that you're, they're going to break your arm for being an effing mutt. And then maybe later on, they, they catch you with some pot and they send you to prison. And then bam, suddenly you're in prison, which means you're a convicted felon, which means you probably can't get a normal job. And if they're doing this on the national level uh, with programs and laws pushed by presidents specifically to do this so that they can go into these prisons uh, and use you for your labor and pay you pennies on the dollar, to make flak jackets and electronic equipment and any and American flags and whatever, like we you're were, going to you you're going to have a population of people who are more likely to make certain choices. Okay, one question, one question: If BLM, after the first spontaneous riot, if BLM would have said, "We will have nothing to do with this," Antifa, get away! No one who riots can still join us. Do you think there would have been more riots or less riots? So, so first off, no, I no, think, please answer the question. Are you? If I they think you're confusing something. The first riot, mm -hmm. Okay. If they would have uh, said, I don't think you know what Antifa I, is. Is the point? So, uh, what I would no, say is, if BLM, no, if yeah. BLM would have said it, if BLM wagged their finger and said no, yeah. well, first off, BLM did denounce rioting in the past. They, they've done it the entire time. But the I second thing is, stop, right? What? Like, well, the thing is, again, you can't control that when it gets down to the level. The do you think there would have been more? No, I don't think. I don't think it would have had any effect whatsoever on whether or not there would have been riots. Because again, what you have here is a population in a pressure cooker. Also, I should I should add that over the last summer, both sides of the political aisle wanted riots. And I think that's why we saw them more often. The Biden administration wanted riots because that makes Trump look weak to their voters. And Trump wanted riots because that makes uh, his voter base afraid. And they were both counting on the, on the, on the political upheaval 
to drive out their voters for the election. And you know do you what? Think BLM worked, handled, right. Do you think BLM handled the riots correctly? I would say the BLM handled the riots to the best of their ability. And it seems to me that BLM and the Biden administration, which is, BLM is not in favor of the Biden administration, but the, the fact is, is that Trump didn't win the election. Um, the, the fact is, is that we now have, um, you know, abolished the police and it, that, that is now a major mainstream issue. And we have high end politicians, you know, taking the knee that specifically shows that they did get their message out and that those riots and everything else overall has moved the country in a position okay. where someone where a murderer like Derek Chauvin can actually be convicted. I guarantee you that if the case of, of Derek Chauvin, if, if, if he had murdered and everything had been exactly the same and it was 2012, I bet you 99% chance he would have walked free. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that BLM has done such a good uh, good job of getting this critique of the system out there, of making people aware okay, of could, these issues, that finally police officers are finally for once beginning to suffer even a tiny amount of uh, pushback when they you know, murder people. You, you just brought up abolish the police. That is another mm -hmm. thing that BLM has initiated that will yeah. do more harm than good for black people because who Only needs police, the, yeah. who needs police the most? Mm -hmm. Innocent black people need police the, police the most. Hmm. You guys, are you In, purposely trying to talk people. at the same time? Okay, so just no, one second. You know, we're doing that thing where one, one guy tries to go left and the other one goes left with him. We're just stuck there. That's a good um, analog. So, uh, yeah. Can I go? Yeah, go. go. Innocent black people, people own, innocent black people owning a store, they need police the most. Yelling, abolish the police will protect them less. So from so, their perspective... BLM is still doing them more harm than good. I, I'm going to give you an example of the Overton window. Are you familiar with the concept of the Overton window? I'm a political scientist. Okay, so you are aware of that. So the fact is, is that um, in the United States in particular, radical arguments, particularly radical left arguments, were almost completely removed from the equation when it came to political speech. And when it, it was, they were so far off in the unthinkable that people weren't able to judge it properly. And I'll give you a perfect example is Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King. I am going to contend that if Malcolm X had not existed and had not made that radical argument um, that he made, Martin Luther King would have been treated as though he was Malcolm X, and that he wouldn't, it, the, the, the fact is, is that you need that radical argument. You need that, that, that fence supposed to throw out there to start the conversation and pull the Overton window in the general direction. We, we, abolish the police, let's get this straight. Abolish the police is not going to abolish the police at, at best. Mm -hmm. And this is what the abolish the police are, are, are arguing for, is that we should do what was done, like for instance, in Camden, New Jersey, where you abolish the police department, you get rid of the people who cannot be prosecuted because like the bad officers that can't fire because of the police unions, and then you rebuild the police. You get a new institution that keeps the good of the, uh, and you are actually able to reform this. That's what defund and abolish is about. It's not actually about like getting rid of the police and replacing okay. them with nothing. Okay. Ha -ha joke. A, a, a little advice as a political spin doctor. Why mm -hmm. don't you say stop police brutality or reform police and don't because say things they did you say don't that. Yeah, but really because they, but, but this is the thing. They did say that and they were treated as though they were saying abolish the police. So if you've okay, got you one group of people, yeah. If so, if you've got one group of people that's sitting there and making a radical, a very radical argument, and you have another group of people that is making a more central argument, what will happen is is that the policy will naturally gravitate towards the people who are making the less radical argument. So uh, okay, well, yeah. So you're familiar. Or, mm -hmm. You're familiar with the Ferguson effect, right? Um, I believe so. Re re refresh my memory with the Ferguson. Well, I think it's the idea that? that after the Michael Brown case, police were more hesitant to maybe sometimes shoot or interact because they wanted to, don't want to be seen as racist or whatever. And that, according to people who studied it, they say has a negative effect on the black people living in the neighborhood because they're not going to be helped as much as before. So, I, you know, that may I'm happen, doing. but I would have to see the actual research on that. I'd have to see who's doing it. Um, and like, so if you can send me a study about that, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But uh, again, I think it's probably for the best that police officers back off a little bit 
because they have one, our police system is incredibly militarized at this point. Um, they're and they are treating because they're you know armed with military grade weapons and they're given like you know freaking tanks and stuff to to patrol the streets. What's ha what happens is is that that is setting a very um, occupying force uh, okay, feeling listen, between them and listen, the man. community. Listen, so I would be yeah. like I'm totally with you if like this would stop crazy police officers from doing crazy stuff like mm -hmm. i would agree with you but if you look at the makia bryant case where the mm -hmm. officer acted perfectly and saved a black girl's life he was mm -hmm. still being targeted as if like he killed a black girl so like i hope you're right that it would have the effect that only the crazy cops don't want to do crazy stuff anymore but i'm afraid it will have the effect that good cops won't even do good things because they're still going to be branded a killer because the people, the person they shot happened to be black, even though the person they saved is also black. Yeah. Like, do you see what I'm getting at? So like, I, I can see people, I, I understand this worry of yours, Yeah. but I think that the problem of police imprisoning and murdering black men is so bad at this point that even if you, you do have the double effect where yeah. good cops are reluctant to act. Overall, you're going to have more of a push towards reform to deal with these bad cops. And overall, you're going to see that the, com that the communities which are now over-policed are going, once they get that boot off their throat, they, they, they are going to move in a more positive direction, even if there are some externalities sometimes where a good cop should have acted, but didn't. Okay, I got, um, I got another question. I think so, I yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I got another question for you. Do you think that if you're a good guy in the U.S., mm -hmm. and let's say you're white and you're a good guy and you want to be a cop, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that what happened in the last year and like the response to the Makia Bryant case, do you think someone like that is more or less likely to join the police force if he knows that even if I shoot a black person holding a knife trying to kill another black person, I still might? get death threats, get fired, get sued. Like, it's not attractive. Like, you're going to get even worse cops, I'm afraid. Like, so, you're going to lose mm -hmm. the good guys because they're like, it's not worth it to me. Even if I save a black life, I'm still going to be like some, like, cop with, killer with a badge, right? So that's what BLM should be working towards, like, not having that image so it's more attractive to be a cop if you're not a psycho because so, we so, so hang on you you think blm should be doing public relations for the police blm should should to take the notice of the makia bryant case and say mm -hmm. unequivocally this is good that this happened if you have a knife and you're trying to kill someone it's good that the cops shoot you also if you're black if they mm -hmm. would have said that you take a lot of tension out of the air but if you use Makia Bryant as another slain uh, black innocent queen, yeah, come on, you're losing me. You're losing a lot of white people. They're just going to think you're a bunch of Marxists. That doesn't help either. We haven't even gone into that one. But yeah. like, it's just bad marketing, man. Like, I mean, what, like what, what, I, what I'm going to point out is, it, it, but the thing is, is that we can objectively look at what's happened with these um, issues and with the discourse over recent years. Um, and if if this is your idea of bad marketing, like BLM is winning. They've been winning really big. Trump, again, Trump was not reelected. Chauvin was convicted. We have uh, abolished the police out there. We, we have all of these issues. So clearly they are doing a really good job. Like they could, they'd be doing a better job. Yeah, probably anybody could be doing a better job at any point in time. But Man, it seems to me that like if, once, if, like the if very fact that we're having this well, debate right now is evidence of what a good job they are doing. Listen, man. Mm -hmm. almost everybody is against police brutality. If BLM would have played their cards right, they would have been at like 85% approval, 90%. Like they're not near those numbers. So we could say that they were successful in their efforts, but- So I almost think... everyone, no, no, I'm sorry. Not almost everyone. I would say about 25% okay. of, the, of the country is explicitly for police brutality. And I will say that as Trump voters are for police brutality. They don't say it in those terms because- okay. When you say someone's like, do you like police brutality? Brutality is an inherently a bad thing. So you've got that there. But when you have uh, people voting for somebody like Trump, when you've got Trump having this huge support from all of the police unions um, and people celebrating the police and putting up those um, uh, thin blue line flags, those people are saying, I am for police brutality. I want the police okay. to go in okay. and no, do no, what they Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, Wait, I'm from the sec. right side you of guys, the- Guys, I, I, I'm just because mm -hmm. I do know that people are going to want to talk about 
even though this is interesting, like the the blue line, uh, it's mm-hmm. like a controversial, okay. juicy and related thing. But nonetheless, I think people are like, well, it's a direct response to, to to Black Lives Matter. Like those those flags were not being sold until after the first Black Lives Matter march. Sure, and, like, and maybe and, and, maybe and you hold on one sec, one vacuum. sec, just so we can get on the they like I'm not taking any stances. Like theoretically, maybe yeah. the the blue line stuff is like a terrible, evil organization. But it, but that's a different question from whether or not BLM is doing more harm than good. So just. The right. uh, it is juicy to hear about the riots. What are your, the alleged riots? I, I mean, Brenton, mm-hmm. I don't know if you would yeah. say that. Well, no, no, I mean, there, there, were, there were riots. Ri- there were riots. Riots are when lightning hits the right spot. Um, and like you will see what's very interesting to me about the riots. I watched the coverage of the riots over the summer, which uh, and then I also remember the coverage of Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I was even like arguing with Destiny about this, that the riot, like he was like, well, if they were just doing what Occupy Wall Street had done, I remember when we were accused of being violent rioters in just the same way, the media hit the same kind of spin on what Occupy was doing, which was almost entirely peaceful to the, the, the they, they've got the, the, the pedal of disapproval all the way on the floor right now when it comes to riots. They had it all the way to the floor at Occupy Wall Street and they've got it all the way to the floor um, with BLM over the over the past summer. And, and the thing is, is that the, over the past summer, it was much, much more violent, more property destruction. People got hit, people got killed. Nobody got killed at Occupy. Um, but the, the fact is, is that again, this is my point. If, Mal- if Malcolm X had not existed, Martin Luther King would have been treated exactly as though he were Malcolm X. And you can even see this. There's an old political cartoon um, from, the, from the period where Martin Luther King is standing there saying like, oh, uh, we plan to have another peaceful um, demonstration tomorrow. And behind him, the political cartoons had drawn everything burnt down from a riot because the, the response is exactly the same from the right, regardless of what actually happened. And so I think that's really, really important to note. And again, I think about 25% of this pop uh, of the United States population is for um, police having the ability to act with impunity when it comes to enforcing the law or what they see as the law. I think there's a lot of bootlickers out there. Yeah, like, like the thing about the riots is like, there's a big difference between lighting up a police station because your point is the cops that work here are racist. Like that connects to way more people than we're stealing sneakers now. Yeah. So in terms of how you present yourself, that's like almost the worst thing you could do. If they only yeah, took our cop cars, mm-hmm. like people wouldn't say it's great, but people would be like, well, they did take out the police. The one organization they said was bad. They didn't like take our stuff. Like they would still be condemned, but it would have a different but you, flavor. Again, to it. you're thinking about this like it's one person. Like it's not the the, the people that, uh, for instance, um, burn the police station are not the people that stole the sneakers. The, 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 there's there's thousands and no, thousands but, but of people like, if in we're talking organizations about, involved in If this. we're talking about BLM, if we're talking about BLM, I'm talking about their response and how they incentivized and cultivated those riots and kind of said you know what, Martin Luther King, language of the unheard. Like they were basically saying, yeah, what are you going to do? And you're basically saying, yeah, what are you going to do? You know, people feel bad. They feel oppressed. Riots happen. So it's not I'm not saying what are you going to do? I I know exactly what you're going to do about that. You're going to change the policies towards these communities. You know, again, what you need to do, and I said this before, no justice, no peace, K-N-O-W. We need to have actual justice with regard to the black community. We need to stop policing them so hard. We need to stop falsely imprisoning them. We need to stop, uh, you know, once again, if you are a black man convicted of murder, you are seven times more likely to be innocent than a white man convicted of murder. That is really messed up, you know? And again, that's only scratching the surface there. So if you want to see these riots not happen, what we need to do is we need to, one, take care of the black community financially. Two, we need to take care of the black community politically, which means don't, um, you know, don't over police them. And three, we need to take care of the black community ideologically. I mean, freaking um, uh, just with the taking the knee, you saw how the country initially reacted to that. And uh, to be clear, he took the knee because a, a, a veteran had said it would be more uh, respectful 
to the military than to simply sit or stay in the in the in the um, in the room. But they turned that taking the knee into a horrible offense because even the tiniest bit of criticism, even if it's respectful, uh, like taking the knee, w- is enough to drive some of these people absolutely insane. Listen, it's, it's it's hard for me to respond to that because it's really tied in with how you guys view the flag and. Mm-hmm. I have an opinion on it, but you know I'm not that culture. If you don't, say, if you don't stand, it. the magical cloth won't freedom. Like I can, <laughs> I can see their, re- I can see their reasoning. Like I wouldn't kneel for like the Dutch or the Suriname flag because I respect them both. But it's it's kind of hard for me to get into the American mm-hmm. flag debate. Yeah, as a well, the, the point is not the American flag debate. The the the, the flag is external to this. Um, the, the the point in the debate is how American culture views black people. And it seems like, and not just Americans in general, but also American institutions, the prison in, cops view black people as a threat to life and limb, particularly black males. I mean, that's borne out by the data. Um, the American institutions view black people either as the political enemies of powerful politicians like Richard Nixon, again, Ehrlichman admitted that, or uh, the other way that they view them as as a potential resource to fill that 90% guaranteed, um, uh, you know, filled beds within uh, these private prisons that operate for profit. So what you've got here is you've got the institutions viewing Black people as dangerous and as an important resource. And then that leads to where we've got, you know, 22% of the world's prisoners with 4% of the world's population. Um, So, you know, this is really, really important for people to understand that all of these issues are interconnected. Um, and and this is, and part of the reason why we are just now becoming aware of it is because Black Lives Matter has been so successful. Okay, let me just let me just say this. So a lot of the things you address, like for-profit prisons and I don't know, have people have a good lawyer when you know they're arrested for having a bag of weed and all that stuff. Like we can talk, man. Like mm-hmm. I'm not a lefty, but I don't want people being imprisoned if all they did was smoke weed. Like yeah, I, I don't see the reasoning behind that. So. So, like, I really think you can gain a lot of common ground with libertarians and not all, but definitely some Republicans. And I would just advise you, I think it's you can do that better by, for instance, acknowledging when a good cop saves a black life and saying, this is a good case. Don't attack this cop. This is what we want to see from police officers when they come into our neighborhoods. And on the other side, when there's a case that doesn't, is up is not up to the standard. Just say, you know what? We're going to pick one where we're like a hundred percent sure it's a bullseye because we don't want to poison the debate anymore. Like mm-hmm. maybe it's too idealistic, but like that's how I view it as a black guy in Europe, just as a political yeah. scientist, being on the right side, but still not wanting the police to have like immunity to kill people. Like why mm-hmm. would I? I don't like the state particularly. Like I'm not an anarchist, but I'm you know. Ayn Rand, uh, uh, minarchist, uh, if you could say so. <laughs> yeah, not that far. So, like, maybe there's some common ground. Just think about what I said about the messaging. I mean, I definitely will keep in mind. I'm not BLM. I'm not a spokesperson no, for them. But, yeah. uh, you know, personally, I have taken a variety of positions on police killing cases, including one where, you know, I'm not even going to get into that because it's completely outside of the realm of this debate. But suffice to say. Um, I, I think that we are kind of doing the the armchair quarterbacking at this point. And what you've also got to remember is that no matter what case BLM picks, the right wing media machine will poke as many holes in it as possible and present it in the worst light possible. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've got well, a great example. Again, woman shot while sleeping in her bed. You blame her. For it, no, I because, didn't blame yeah. her. Come on, don't be. Like, you, well, you said she the police were, yeah, yeah, but so you said, I'm not you, yeah, so you blamed me. her boyfriend, who acted well, exactly more than her, per- obviously, yeah. like, who who acted exactly perfectly rational as to what happens when somebody breaks in your door in the middle of the night with weapons, like, and you don't know who they are, because again, listen, the police did not announce themselves. It was a no knock raid. He didn't know they were police. Could have been anyone, and he was also listen, asleep at the time. I just want to say that. On the right side, there are also a lot of people who are still critical. So if you would present me with a case where I could consider the racism or the brutality to be so evident, even if the right would go along with it, I would tell right-wingers, don't go along with this one because this one is correct. Like Philando Castile, 
Like, mm-hmm. I never went against Fernando Castillo. Like, everyone, like, from Ben Shapiro, like, everyone says Fernando Castillo is terrible. So, like, if your case is really convincing, you can get the biggest people on the right to agree with you. Almond I, Arbery, you know, I'm Ben Shapiro dis- agrees with you, too. So I, I'm, I'm going like- to disagree with that because, again, these people are, their positions are mostly ad hoc. You know, Ben Shapiro may pick a, an occasional case, but he is not a good faith actor. Um, I would, in fact, I'd say just about every pundit, right or left, even is not a good faith actor. Good, even if we are convinced he's not a good faith actor, you cannot deny that he has influence. And if mm-hmm. Ben Shapiro is willing to go on the Arbery case and, and the Freddie Gray case, I think, and the Castile case mm-hmm. and say, you know what? Those three are really bad. Like, mm-hmm. that's a profit for BLM. Like, BLM needs that sure. to gain ground in the culture. But all, but also what I'm going to point out is you've got somebody, you're essentially saying that BLM needs to tailor their message to speak to the most reactionary people out there, to the absolute worst racists of the worst, like Ben no, Shapiro. No. I'm saying like, this. I'm mm-hmm. saying if there is an abundance of cases, as you claimed, mm-hmm. of black men being killed for no reason, you should definitely be able to select like five a year that are so strong, even Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens are like, yeah, but even then, even if you, so even if you did that, even if you did this, this thing exactly the way that you say, first off, there's going to be people who are going to lie about it and try to take it down in just the same way and cast as much doubt on it as possible. I agree. Good example. Um, So it it will give you the impression that they're picking people that aren't good simply because the right wing media machine has done its work and to try to convince everybody that, you know. But the good people on the right will not be able to withstand the pressure if the evidence is so clear. And they would say, you know what, guys? Let's just attack you know, when they I, have a bad case again. I think you think people are more rational than they actually are, especially Perhaps. the people on the right. And, and I, right. I will point to the fact that, you know, Trump, uh, you know, he is objectively a mass murderer in that he allowed COVID to kill hundreds of thousands of people oh, that man. didn't otherwise. Let's not die. get into that. Yeah, but, 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 but. but but even with that, even with crashing the economy and even with COVID, he had a higher percentage of Republicans voting for him this time around than the last time. The, the fact is Can that a lot of people simply BLM. think Trump. Yeah. 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 So, uh, now, there is something that you brought up that I wanted to kind of talk about here. Um, and this is that you brought up that BLM is a Marxist organization. Now, can you yeah. please elaborate? Because I, I know that there are Marxists involved with BLM because Marxists are political. They're involved in the left, you know, in the same way that anarchists are and everybody else. Um, and, you know, just all the way down to like regular old liberals and progressives. So what is your beef, one, if BLM is a Marxist organization? I mean, I know yeah. objectivists aren't fond of Marxists, but yeah. like what is... So, so, so first let's off, go into that a little bit more. Yeah, so, so first off, obviously... You're free to be a Marxist, and we can still agree on police brutality. Mm-hmm. And you're I'm free not a Marxist, tell, for the record. Yeah, yeah. You can. Oh, you're also free to tell people you're a Marxist and still want mm-hmm. them to support your police anti police brutality thing. But I think at least two leading figures of BLM have admitted to being trained Marxist or like. Yeah, so is Rosa Parks. Uh, Patrice Coulors, uh, I think, is one of them. So, yeah. but uh, again, combined, Rosa yeah. Rosa Parks was a trained Marxist. Okay, and, but as, yeah. I, as I said, if the case is correct, the case is correct. So I, I agree with you. If the Marxists were right on every case, I would still agree with them on this point. Okay, but good. I do not think it helps your case if you have shaky cases and you have the black fist and you allude to Marxism and you talk about taking away people's property. And then there are riots where people's property is being laid up. It doesn't really help with the messaging that you're a peaceful organization, yeah. right? You get me? So, so the first thing that you need to understand is that, um, you know, the communist, CPUSA and a number of other communist parties, they have long time, because of what Marxists are interested in, you know, um, which is protecting the most mo- vulnerable people in society and raising them up, uh, like Marxism has been tied in with like black liberation for a really, really long yeah. time. Individual people who are Marxists in BLM, fine, even if they're leaders, it doesn't make BLM a Marxist organization. Not per se. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's unfair to characterize the organization like, like that. Now, there will be some things like in one BLM website, somebody once um, said something like along the fact that they said that they wanted to abolish the traditional family. Now, yeah. this is not good messaging, in my opinion. But th- this, it, again, just like the problem with when people hear um, like uh, abolish the police, they don't actually realize what it is. They just hear the slogan and go with what's in their head as opposed to what it actually is politically. Um, similar things happen with like phrases like abolish the family. Uh, the fact is, is that the nuclear family in the 1950s was a product of the nuclear age, hence nuclear. That's why they compared it to an atom because it was the freaking 50s and everybody was up about the atom bomb. That is not the traditional family that humans have lived in. Um, so when BLM has on their website that they want to um, oppose the traditional family, it specifically says that they want to go back to more extended families and clan-based families. And the thing is, is that that is actually the more conservative position because that's how humans have tended to live for the longest time. But these reactionaries just simply see that and they flip out and they think that these people are secret communists. Like red baiting is is huge in the right and they will tar and feather any individual they can get a hold of and call them a Marxist, whether it's freaking Obama or um, Bernie Sanders. Like it doesn't matter. They They always say they're a Marxist. Okay, but like like this claim about saying that people are communists falsely and then mentioning Bernie Sanders as an example. Bernie Sanders is not a communist. <laughs> no, but like, come on. Like, you cannot Bernie, say no, no, he's here, so here, far here, removed. No, here's socialism. what Bernie Sanders is. Politically, Bernie Sanders is a sock dem. He's a social democrat. He's not even a socialist. But he's also smart enough as a politician to know that no matter what he says, if he says, I'm not a socialist, the people on the right will say, yes, you are. You're lying. So all he did was he very brilliantly got ahead of it and told everybody he was a socialist and a democratic socialist, and it's a new thing, and he pulled the discussion to the left. Now, I think that's a really good thing because I think American politics are way, way too far to the right overall. Um, but but the fact is, is that Bernie does not actually advance any socialist policies. He doesn't want, for instance, any worker control of the means of production. At most, he'll talk about voluntary co-ops as opposed to the government seizing like actual capital and giving it to the workers. So similarly, there's a lot of red baiting going on. And then secondly, you know, yeah, are there Marxists involved with a leftist political organization? Absolutely, because Marxism, it's a small force, but they are very political and they're involved in a lot of uh, organizations. And like, there's not, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Um, Rosa Parks, again, trained Marxist. Rosa Parks is also one of the greatest, you know, humanitarians in the world who changed the way that we think about a lot of things. So, and she is rightly lionized for that. So I, I really feel like bringing up the Marxism and BLM is a bit of an attempt to grapple onto 1950s government propaganda related specifically to the Red Scare. No, hold on, hold on. If people tell me they're trained Marxist, like I'm going to believe what they tell me. I didn't make up that quote, right? Sure, so, sure. But, uh, and I don't have a problem believing that some people who work with No, BLM, the founders, which, yeah. not some people. Like, Even I'm if they're the founders. The, yeah, a but guy who walked along a BLM rally or something, like, yeah. come on. Okay, so here's the thing, and I, this is probably because you haven't talked to a lot of Marxists. Um, Marxists, like when you talk to them, you know it's a freaking Marxist really fast because they, they've got sticks up their butts and they talk about stuff like dialectical materialism. <laughs> like, you know, if you understand, like, and, and you run in these circles on the far left, um, you, you would know that BLM is not a Marxist organization. It's not Maoist like the Black Panthers were, the original Black Panthers. And, you know, again, Black Panthers were explicitly a Maoist organization. They were also a really effective, great organization, you know? So um, the, the idea that BLM might be Marxist, I don't think, even if it were true, it wouldn't necessarily be a slight against them. Um, but even if it were a slight against them, like, they, it's not a Marxist organization. Okay, okay. As a final, maybe a rebuttal, I agree with you that technically them being Marxist or their founders being Marxist does not invalidate their entire case. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this as a political scientist and I'm Mm -hmm. looking at uh, messaging and marketing. And if your goal was to convince everyone in the country, but it doesn't have anything to do with Marxism, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't bring up the Marxism. But that's just me. 
Can I hear something as a political scientist? I, I'd like yeah. to hear some statistical evidence from you, or some say that, that proves that they're not that BLM is not doing a good job of getting this out. Because from everything we've said in this debate, it seems like they're doing an absolutely phenomenal job of getting their message across well, I and, and making political media, change. I actually think the media does a lot of the work for them, and you were correct in in pointing mm -hmm. that out. I I take myself as as one example. Obviously, I'm not the norm, but I'm one example of a person who is actually black, who would agree with them if I was convinced they were telling the truth. But because of the combination of the Marxism and the riots and the lying and the using Makia Bryant as another slain victim while she was guilty, I'm so, turned off. And I'm sure there are more black people that don't agree with the core of what you're trying to achieve but they're going to log out. And I'm sure there are a lot of white people who would agree to the exact same things, but are like, you know what? I want to support them, but if I keep finding out that the cop shot the guy with the knife trying to kill the girl, like there is going to be a point where people are going to log out and you see the numbers going down in the US. I agree with you. It's still a high number. So mm -hmm. maybe in like a relative sense, they are successful, but maybe in a potential sense, they lost a lot of ground they could have gained. That's always hard to determine. Yeah, but again, you have to understand, so this may be just simply because you're not an American. And so, you know, you were not raised in a culture that was built on the extermination of one race and the enslavement of another. Like the, the systems of white supremacy, like from the very beginning, from America's original sin, that is built into our political structure, whether the individuals who act within that political structure are racist themselves or not. If you are a non-racist cop, for instance, and you are enforcing a drug law against a black person, you are doing racism. Like, because those laws were put in place specifically to target them and to allow the police to attack them, to break up their meetings, to jail their leaders. So but we have no, we yeah. have no disagreement on any of these laws, if you could point to me a law that is racist, I am not going to object. Like, like mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with you as a libertarian. If you can find yeah. me a racist law, I'm for taking it down. And someone like Shapiro, even though you think he's bad faith, even though you might think he's a racist, believe me, it's very hard for him if it's in written in law and it's racist and you could prove it, it's going to be very hard for him to tell his audience, no people, nothing going on. If you can apply know. that pressure, you're going to gain ground. Maybe I'm too idealistic. You could be correct. I'm yeah. just trying to look at the most effective way of presenting uh, solutions. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I, I will point out, we still haven't seen, I, I'm getting anecdotal stuff from you. And the, the most that you've done so far is you've appealed to supposedly support for BLM coming down. Well, slightly, supposedly, it's still they, very they, high. They, did, they researched it. It's not like yeah. someone supposed it only, right? So, yeah. Well, yeah. But again, I'm, I'm they, you're they, not giving me the study. You're not giving me the percentages. You know, I'm just taking it. I'm taking you at your word that this is something that's happened recently. I think we both saw those news. Uh, we both saw the no, news about it, right? No, you I, didn't? I, I, I don't okay. watch the news. <laughs> okay, I specifically, I, I, I avoid really, the news. <laughs> I would assume that you would have heard about the national polls on BLM. Like, I'm I sorry, mean, I don't have the exact lots, number. No, th this is the thing. There's lots down. of, yeah, there's lots of, and I believe that it did. I just, again, support for a specific policy is going to go up and down and up and down throughout as, that. I mean, that's just the political process. A great example, you know, might be gay marriage. You know, uh, mm. just back when I was in college, it was freaking outlawed and most of the country was against it. And then, you know, through the Obama years, Obama pretended because he's got no. Uh, he, uh, Obama just basically he is much more self-interested than a lot of people think. Um, but, you know, he pretended like he had serious spiritual issues with gay marriage until it was politically convenient. I think the only person that took longer to turn around on gay marriage was Hillary Clinton. And again, because she looked at the polls, but the polls changed. And once they changed, the whole country flipped. And by the time Donald Trump got into office, he couldn't roll back the clock even on gay marriage. Um, and the, th the thing is, is that that same process is happening with BLM, that same process is happening with, you know, trans liberation, any kind of civil rights will go through periods where the popularity goes up and down with regard to the news cycle and the events and what happens. It's just, you know, that, that that's just 
politics as is. So I think you might be looking at a more isolated data point, but I think the further we go, the more um, Black Lives Matters position is going to uh, make sense in much the same way that I can talk about the, um, the, the, the Black Panthers, again, literal Maoist organization, original Black Panthers, by the way, the new ones are, are very racist. Um, but the original Black Panthers, I can talk about them in a positive light. Whereas if I talked about the Black Panthers in a positive light when the Black Panthers were doing their stuff, I would be in danger of losing my job and all of my friends with the House of Un-American Activities Committee. And, you know, the freaking FBI killed Fred Hampton in his bed. And by the way, said, you know, the N-word's dead afterwards. So the just like we saw the radical position of the Black Panthers in the 60s suddenly become much closer to the acceptable mainstream position now in, you know, 2020, uh, 2021, um, uh, we're going to see as time continues, Black Lives Matter's position is going to move closer and closer to the political okay. center. The vibe I'm getting from you is uh, the, the, the ends justify the means. Is that correct? No, no. Uh, I'm not I, saying the I ends justify like... the means. I'm saying, so like if something bad happens along the road to a better world, that bad things still happened. But if we're judging a movement, an entire movement's success and, and ability, what we need to look at is all of the data as far as, you know, the overall trend versus focusing too much on any one data point we we don't want to miss the forest for the trees okay so hold on so if i could give you a poll that says the support for blm has gone down to five percent of the population it's not true mm -hmm. but if i were to present you with such a poll would you then agree with me i would say i don't know if i'd agree with you overall but what i would say was if that poll yeah. was representative and if yeah. we were able yeah. to replicate that poll several times yeah. it seemed to actually be representative of yeah. where i i would say there would there was a serious public relations problem going on there that was that needed fixing most likely um, okay because yeah because if that was the that number would only matter in the sense of are they being successful but it wouldn't change anything about how i think they acted mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, but, but, but the, the debate they is, are they, them. yeah, but the debate yeah. is, do they do more harm than good? Um, yeah, I, but I suppose I think, what, yeah, so, but, but, but I think there is something more than just the polls that if you're an organization that is becoming more influential every year, we're going to assume, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having such a, a, a poor basis, like having lied so much in the first couple of years about the first big cases. Again, I don't I think, think they lied. Yeah, but Okay, I'm presenting you this vision. I mm -hmm. think that's going to bite them in the in the in the future, because you saw how it bit them in the ass with the Makia Bryant case, because they were like stuck in a corner. Because either mm -hmm. they were going to say the cop handled right, and then maybe right wingers would have said, "Oh, but hold on, Michael Brown tried, tried to take his cop." So you're saying the Michael Brown killing was all right? So they felt trapped. They were like, "We've been lying so much, we might as well lie now and say he just shot another innocent black girl." So now, like they're they're stuck in this in this hole, but even even if it's I mean, objectively good again, the top I, I, I would have, have to look to at their I would have to look at their response to that and if there has been a follow up. They put uh, it on the, the website. The, they yeah. put the Makia Bryan case on the website. Uh, yeah, this thing I'm not yeah. familiar with Makia Bryan case. Um, That's the one with so, the knife. Yeah, and she was shot. Yeah. I, I remember vaguely hearing about it, but like I, I didn't like go in. I would need to study this in depth and study their reaction to, to give you a, an informed response to whether they were in the right so or my, the wrong. So my path. theory is mm -hmm. uh, if you lie in the beginning, even mm -hmm. if you think the ends justify the means, or even if you think you're doing more. You, you're, good you're implying a lie. Hang on, hang on. You're implying a lie. So even if, let's so say, for instance, sure they weren't lying, they were just wrong. You're not as well. Uh, do you guys, mm -hmm. yeah. Brenton and uh, Yurnaz, if you feel that the time has been well balanced in terms of how much you've gotten to see? If what? you feel like that? Do you you guys feel good about that? I, I really couldn't say. I want to make sure you guys I, both I'm feel fine, like but Yurnaz, if you, if you want to, if I'm interrupting you too much, if you want to say something, go. How many? How much time do we have left still? We've got or... just a few minutes before we go into the Q&A. So now is actually like a pretty good time where... It, Drawing together the threads from this discussion is good as well. Okay, so maybe I could do like a final thing and then, is that okay? Let's see. Yeah, that's fine with me. If, if you do a pithy one and then we can do the same for Brent. 
Yeah, so uh, let's just pick it off where, where I left off. So this is my this is my analysis. If an organization that starts out by not telling the truth about some major cases in the beginning of their rise and their influence, it's going to box them into a corner and there's going to come a point where they need to switch it up. They need to either say, we're done with riots and every new case is going to be totally legit and they take some accountability or they keep on lying. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen to BLM, that even the couple of good things they brought across are going to be drowned out. But by all the times they have to they feel the need that they have to lie about good policemen. So I just think they poisoned themselves in the long run. They are somewhat effective. I can agree with you partly on that. I just think their potential is way bigger because I think way more people agree with the core or of their grievances and they don't help themselves by amplifying uh, wrong cases. Yeah, and what I'll say is um, having watched and been involved to a, to a small extent with BLM, you know, from the very beginning, like I was there at the Million Hoodies March uh, after Trayvon Martin was murdered. Um, I, was, I was there in the street with Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I was there in solidarity with them uh, at the very first Black Lives Matter march ever in New York City, which is one of the biggest marches they, they'd had since like N17. Um, and watching the way the culture responded to them and the reaction to um, all of this awful stuff coming out about the police in general. Um, with And to be very clear, the police are incredibly violent and kill a lot of white people as well uh, for similarly bad reasons, not at the same rate, but, it, but it's there. Um, having watched this and also, you know, having watched activists, um, you know, continue to mainstream these issues uh, and being educated, reasonably educated on um, the overall problems of uh, th that the black community faces specifically because of their race, both uh, political problems, uh, social problems, and economic problems. Um, you know, part of the reason I was able to tell you about what John Ehrlichman did um, part, you know, about what the Nixon White House did to them. Part of the reason why I was able to make the connection uh, between the lead paint, the, the between redlining and, and lead paint and Freddie Gray to the time that Freddie Gray was killed by those police officers uh, in the back of that uh, van during the rough ride. That is in a lot of ways, most likely, I can't draw exact line, but that's in a lot of ways because Man. of Black Lives Matter, because they've that's been about able the same to draw attention time as you're, so, you're not side. You, yeah, are you I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So so the, the point is, is that we are at a crossroads here where we are finally making some serious progress, probably the most progress we've seen since um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, 1968. Um, but we need to keep moving. And I think Black Lives Matter as an organization is going to continue to be a major linchpin in this particular form of the civil rights struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our guests are linked in the description, folks. So if you want to hear more or read more, you certainly can by clicking on those links. And also, folks, if you didn't know, this is a 12-hour live stream. We have two more debates to go after this one. And this one, we're just getting into the Q&A. So we have plenty of juicy questions coming in that we're excited to ask the speakers but do want to let you know we'll be here i in particular will be here all day so i hope you peek in throughout the day if you have to do errands or whatever else it is don't worry we'll still be here and you can always tune back in throughout the day so thanks so much for your first question this one coming in from logical oh that's not it to oh you know what one let me just get this organized i'm realizing that it updates the thumbnail in the creator studio so it makes it harder for me to see where to start thank you very much for your question this one coming in from hake of the hake report thank you very much says brianna taylor was not shot sleeping in her bed police knocked and announced when they should not have no that's a lie they did not knock on as it was a no knock raid. It's one of the major reasons why no knock raids are uh, currently like being repealed throughout the country. Um, she was it was specifically a no knock raid. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Meduce NCO says not even all black people support BLM. That should tell everybody something. Stop resisting arrest. Why would all any group of people think with a single mind? 
Like no, no, nobody does that. There's always going to be disagreement with regard to as much as from what should we have for dinner to what this poli- this uh, political organization is. Just because not all black people support it doesn't mean they're not overall supported by the black community. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. Coming in from Hake of the Hake Report says, zero evidence that Derek Chauvin was quote unquote racist. BLM is. Yeah. Okay. Again, the, this, I think he's just playing with the definition of racism here and whether he, the, the job of the court was not to find out whether he was racist or not. It was to find out if he was a murderer and he absolutely was a murderer. And I think, you know, to tell you the truth, um, that particular murder race played into such a, a great degree that I think they probably could not have won that case had the perception that he acted unfairly towards uh, um, George Floyd not been there. So I think in a way, the murder conviction, while it wasn't officially a you're racist, it was you're a murderer. And also, yeah, you're probably a racist murderer. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this one from Hake says it was a no knock raid. But they did knock and announce, and that's why the neighbor yelled at them. Yeah, okay. Again, even if they did (laughs) knock and announce, the people were sleeping at the time. They didn't give adequate um, knowledge on it. And even if we do say that they're not lying, which, by the way, I think they're probably just lying about that. um, Because, again, even if the neighbor is saying they heard something or yelled at them to be quiet – eyewitnesses don't usually remember events exactly how they happened it, it's it's one of the least reliable things that we can have they busted into a woman's uh house in like the middle of the night and shot her dead while she was in her bed like that's completely unacceptable on every level whether they uh happen to hey police bang or if it was just bang either way like that's not how one of those situations should ever okay, be okay what, what, what hold up hold up if they knocked and they told the police and he shot at them, do you still blame them for shooting at him and then accidentally hitting her? Are you I still mean, gonna call them killers? Like, come on. I well, killers, yes, they literally did kill someone. So yes, if you kill someone, you are a killer, regardless of the reasons <laughs> beyond it. But like if they said police and he woke up and shot at them. Well, then I would say they were still more in the wrong than he was. One, wow. Yeah. And here, here's why. Let me explain. So here's why. If you are a law enforcement organization with people who are trained to trained to arrest people and to kill people, and you've got your officers there with their body armor and they're all backed up, it is on you to take extra precautions to make sure that something like that doesn't happen. We should always see officers should be in more danger than in the people that they are uh, supposedly protecting. Because again, that's sort of the job there. We can't afford to have our police officers be cowardly and kill people who don't deserve it. So you think it's aggression if the police shoot back? I don't know what they're trying to arrest. Again, I don't care. I don't really care about aggression. In this instance, that's not the problem. The problem is, yeah, no, the problem is they went to force far too quickly and they also um, did not adequately announce themselves. So even if they knocked on the door, imagine you're sleeping in bed and you hear a big heavy knock at the door and a, and a loud man yelling. You're getting up. You're groggy. You don't know. You probably can't hear that well. What was that? Was I dreaming it? Oh, no, there's someone coming in my door. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, okay, yeah, hold on. So we you're conveniently leaving. This is the, I, you're I, conveniently leaving. I want to do. You're Nas. I promise. I'll give you a chance to. You guys, for this is a related question on the same topic. Hake mm-hmm. said okay. Brianna's body was in the hallway, not the bed. Whatever. You know, like I said, whether she was shot in the hallway or shot in the bed, it doesn't matter. Again, these are people yes, who are Yes, it sleeping. does. No, it doesn't. Because these are because people who were sleeping. Because you created the narrative that the cops were just shooting at an empty, at a bed where a woman was sleeping whoa, whoa, whoa. because they wanted to kill her. No, and now uh, whoa, it's whoa, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on, hang on. I didn't say anything about them wanting to kill her. I didn't okay. say anything they at killed. all about them wanting okay. to kill her. You fine, know? fine. Um, I, I, again, I think what happened there was you had a bunch of people who were gung-ho and thought they were soldiers. And th- there's a big thing to go on. Like, really, what you need to look up like is this guy who has been training police officers all over the country who claims he's an expert in killology and is literally trains police officers to go for their guns first. Like not exactly like that, but like, okay, okay, but, but dude, listen, listen, you're leaving out the context that this guy is a 
violent drug dealer. If no, you he's are not. A violent dro- he's not a violent are- drug dealer. Her ex-boyfriend was a drug dealer. And also keep in mind, what are you saying? You're talking about it again. A violent drug dealer. Geez, why would drugs get violent? Oh, right. The war on drugs started by oh, Nixon no, for racist reasons. Now. Like, come on. <laughs> yes, it is. We're talking about... No, we're talking about if you're a drug dealer and you hear people but knocking the guy on your was door. Not, the, no, the boyfriend and was you not start a drug shooting, dealer. You know what's coming. Like, come the guy, on. Yeah, but hang on. The guy was not a drug dealer. Okay, first off, he was not. It was her ex-boyfriend who was a drug dealer. Um, was the address. Yes. And you know what? If you're sitting there in bed with your uh, with your new girlfriend and you know that her ex-boyfriend was a drug dealer and probably was violent and suddenly there's yelling at your door and the door gets knocked in, you you may start shooting because, hey, maybe it's that guy. Maybe it's him coming back for revenge or whatever. We do have like, one from even, Jesse. Yes. They say Brianna, her boyfriend, and her boyfriend were awake. The cops fired at them after her boyfriend reacted in self-defense. Actual Justice Warrior has the complete story. The actual Justice Warrior is a Nazi. Screw him. Oh, um, let's not do what that. A great not argument. Defend themselves. What a great argument. No, you know, the thing is, is that, again, like, these people are liars. And and th- that's the point. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll give you a specifically uh, politically motivated story. An actual Justice Warrior is a propagandist. He's going You're, to lie to you. He's, well, he's not here to defend himself. So it's very yeah. seriously, okay. let's not talk about him when he's not here to defend himself. Fair enough. The... This one coming in from, do appreciate your question, Rising Power says the debate was over after Brenton's intro, which was well composed and backed up by historical and statistical evidence. Future debaters raise the bar to Brenton. Well, you got a fan (laughs) out there, Brenton. And, you know, (laughs) I have to give, I want to say thank you, huge thank you. We've got more questions, don't worry, but I want to say huge thank you to our guests. We do appreciate the speakers. And want to remind you, I know it's a fiery topic. Please do attack the arguments, folks, instead of the person. That means a lot. And then Medusa NCO says, all this cop hate, go live where there aren't any. Um, Okay, so I did that, actually. I lived both where there were a bunch of cops, like, and where there were not a bunch of cops. When I lived in Manhattan, New York City, full of cops, the cops were the primary threat to life and limb. Not, not for me as much, but still dealing with the NYPD oftentimes is like dealing with a rabid dog. Like you really don't know what they're going to do. Um, And it gets even worse for people who are in minorities, and particularly when I was there at the height of stop and frisk. Uh, and I lived where there were no cops on the Appalachian Trail because there's no cops freaking 40 miles out into the woods. And I was safer there than I've ever been at any other point in my life. And again, part of the reason is, is cops. It's very important for people to remember everybody in the United States are really afraid of terrorists. Um, but th- the fact of the matter is you are more likely to be shot and killed by a cop than by a terrorist. You're actually, yeah, in, well, with terrorists, you're more likely to be killed by your own furniture. But the point is, is that the police force is a genuine threat to the health and safety of the American citizen. Not all of us, not all the time, not all of them, but yeah. Cider and Port says too, Stay you're Nas. Yeah. They say, we don't pick yeah. up the people that BLM use. You do. As soon as you demonize or villainize a black person, then BLM has their back. You chose the people that BLM uses, not us. Props to Brenton. Yeah. I, ahead, for for record, I don't think you, it's you're your Naz who did that. Yeah, like, I don't know. You, do you want to respond to your Naz? Yeah. Well, I like the, what does he mean? I'm choosing the cases? Like, like he's, who he's am using I you as a, like, Yeah, he's using you as a stand in for the right wing media for, for reactionary media. Like, I don't think you individually cho- chose those cases, but. You know, uh, it's a good point that every time like uh, a black person is you killed by the nuts. police, there's that. We don't need you. To, no, no, no offense, Brent. Exactly. Right? But yeah. so, I, I was just going to say we don't <laughs> need fine. you to add too much onto it because I, I still want to give your Nas a chance to respond to this <laughs> yeah, yeah. if he wants. Do you get? Do you get that? Well, I I actually think I actually think I'm pretty nuanced, and I've admitted to a couple of cases where I think the evidence is quite uh, clear, and I don't feel I need to argue with them. But yeah. I'm just going to be critical of every organization, especially if they're if they're saying that they're representing black people and I am black. So, yeah, I think I can say something about it. Gotcha. And thank you very much. I think you. everyone could say something about it, actually. But thanks for your question. Yeah. This comes in from Medusa and CEO. No, rising power. Nope. Cider and Port had the next one said the moment you say, quote, they were no angel, unquote. It doesn't matter what the person has done. They don't deserve to be killed in police. Uh, killed by police. Why is that controversial? You're not. 
Yeah, so I really hate this framing where people say, he did X, he didn't deserve to die. Like, if you steal one piece of candy, but then you knock a cop in his face and try to steal his 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 gun, and you're going to get shot, of course it wasn't the candy that made you deserve to die. You were just being stupid and took the risk of dying after stealing candy. So you're stupid. So, I, like, I hate that framing. No one says they deserve it because of the crime they commit. They deserve it. They don't deserve it. They, it happened to them because they took an incredibly crazy risk after going against the law. So, And you don't like, think because they're dead and the cop is the only one there that they just lying about them doing the incredibly crazy thing? I mean, again, a uh, great example at Occupy, the Cecily McMillan trial. Cecily was in the park when the police officers were clearing it. Uh, an officer, by the way, who's since been let go, um, like reached around and grabbed her breast and not knowing who it was, she went back, she elbowed him in the eye. Oops, police officer, suddenly she gets the crap kicked out of her, wakes up handcuffed to a bed, facing seven years in prison for assaulting a police officer. Um, similarly, what happened with me? Again, I was Sorry. not resisting in any way, yeah, but, but they like, still said it because that they're, 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 they're trying each other Brandon. to do it. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just teasing you, buddy. I'm, 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 all right, yeah. so next up, this one coming in from Hake Report says BLM, Lies to people who don't know better, encouraging hatred and presume people guilty despite exoneration. BLM doesn't value their own lives. Um, I don't no, know. Black how lives, he means, maybe. Yeah. Or... I, again, I don't really see how one relates to the other. Like, even if you're going to say that they're lying, and I don't think they're lying. Um, I think that's you guys believing they're lying because you believe the right wing media spin on it. Um, but even if they were lying, the problem is still there. It's still real, statistically, objectively. Brent, so, Brent yeah. do you believe in left wing uh, propaganda? Oh, yeah, absolutely. OK. Also around these cases? Yeah, absolutely. OK. Yeah. Like, like the, the thing is, is that the left wing media machine, there isn't nearly the power behind it than the right. Like you can't make a career being an anarchist or a communist speaker for the most part. Like there's occasional ones like Noam Chomsky. Um, but like for the most part, socialists are completely shut out of the conversation from the left. And particularly in the United States, it may be different in the Netherlands, but like oh, definitely. In, yeah. <laughs> in, in the United States, because of McCarthyism, because of the these purges of the left that went on, um, you know, during the 1950s and 1960s, um, the radical left voices are not represented for the most part. And they're certainly not represented with money, power, or prestige. You can make a ton of money being a radical right-wing voice in America. And, you know, once again, Tucker Carlson is the uh, number one most watched person in all of cable news. Um, the the right-wing media machine is so much more powerful than the left-wing one. It's, it's not even David versus Goliath. It's Goliath versus a freaking cockroach. We'll move it. Okay, but the... you admit that, but you admit that no, left-wing news I, organizations I are lying. We, okay. I I all news organizations lie or spin. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> and, but, and that would include left wing ones. Thank you very much. Hake says murders increase after BLM gets credence from the government. Focus <laughs> in effect, baby. <laughs> okay, so first off, correlation is not causation. <laughs> you would have to then demonstrate that it was because of that. And secondly, no murders have not increased. We've been seeing a general downtrend in um, both um, murders and overall violent crime and overall crime for years and years. We, we, the only times you can say that murders might have gotten more likely because of BLM is situations like um, freaking Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, where people he was defending himself, man. He, he, he was not; he's a murderer. But anyway, no, the, the, we we can talk we can talk about that later. But the point being is is that yeah, a couple maybe like the only things that you can chalk up to BLM, the only kinds of murders you could chalk up to BLM are like when people attack marches and drive trucks through there, or if someone shoots back at one of those people or something. You know that that kind of killing could be chalked up to them, but simply chalking up random violence it makes no sense and you know it's next, very bad faith next up this one from hake says capital protest became the language of the unheard 
Um, no. I, I, the, so again, the Capitol <laughs> protest. No, no, because the Capitol protest was not really a riot in the strictest sense. That was planned uh, specifically by Donald Trump and QAnon. They knew exactly what they were going to do. They were attempting a coup. They're just bad at it. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that you might, I know they feel like they're unheard. So you could maybe kind of talk about that, but also like, you know, if you look at the socioeconomic status of a lot of the people involved in uh, the January 6th insurrection, you find a lot of them are like, they're, one of the women, she was like a super rich um, uh, real estate agent who was flying all over the country. You know, QAnon, th that, that's a cult. It is, exactly. it, is a, it is a cult and it was a cult joined with fascists. Take strikes again. He says- <laughs> Black mothers actually beg for more police presence in their own communities, according to Heather McDonald. Okay, I don't know who Heather McDonald is, so I, I don't care. <laughs> I can look that well, up. It, it, does, it does tie into the point that I made that innocent black people need police the most. That's just not true. Like, I, I can tell you from having watched how police treated innocent black people in New York during the, the height of stop and frisk, it's just not the case. Like, cops are dangerous. I, I cannot stress that enough. And they are specifically dangerous to you if you are a black man. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question, Pancake of Destiny, like Destiny Steven. Now they say BLM wants special treatment for black people from police slash workplaces slash colleges. It is racist and it assumes that black people are inferior. What do you think about that, Brent? So in, it in no way assumes that black people are inf inferior. It assumes rightly that black people are unfairly targeted by the system for malicious reasons, which again, we have the proof, Richard Nixon, war on drugs, uh, mass incarceration, th these are all facts. Um, now, as far as, so they're not assuming that black people, that doesn't mean that black people would be inherently inferior in any way. Um, what was the first part of that again? Because I did want to respond to it, but um, I got caught up on that. What's the first part? They had said that BLM wants special treatment for black people from police and workplaces and colleges. Yeah. That was it. So special treatment. Um, okay. This is uh, akin to saying, I have a broken arm, so I need to get into the hospital before the person who has a black eye. And you say, oh, that's special treatment. Special treatment for someone is only a problem when it is special treatment that is out of the bounds of reality. So if I go to the front of the line for illogical reasons, then that is a biased treatment of me. But it is very logical that we should deal with this problem with the black community because they are being shot and killed and imprisoned at so much of a higher rate to the point where seven, uh, seven black, innocent black men will be put in prison to every one innocent white man put in prison. That's that's must, completely wrong. Must move on. This one coming in from Jesse says BLM is winning. So they are clearly correct. Quote unquote. They said this might makes right mentality from Brenton is disturbing. <laughs> I have had nothing to do with might makes right. We were talking about were they an effective organization? And as was saying that they were not effective. And I was saying, well, they seem to be very effective. Based but you were, this. but you were, but you were saying the ends justify the means. I felt I definitely was not. No. This I don't one, believe okay. the ends justify. I'm a Buddhist dude. I, I don't believe the ends justify the means. This one coming in from Hick says police. Let's see. I think I had this one. Oh yeah, we did read that one. And then they, but they did say this one, Colin Kaepernick falsely smeared cops of getting away with murder. Meanwhile, 20% of murders solved in Chicago. And then they said, misleading kids is pure evil. Um, again, Cops have been getting away with murder for a really long time. Uh, we'll go back to Freddie Gray. All of the officers involved in that were acquitted. Um, co the cop who killed um, Eric Garner got away with murder. The, the, in fact, I would say the only time so far that a cop has not gotten away with murder when it came to the high profile killing of a black man that I can think of is most recently with Chauvin. And that was just because it was so overwhelming. Nobody could deny it except Yaraz denied it. Um, so I, I would say overall, it, it there we do not have that going on, and these are not lies being told to children. You want to live in a bubble. You want to live in a world where these things don't happen, and I sympathize with that, but the fact is this is reality. It's happening. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Hake says 13% of the population 
but 40% of cop killers, according to Heather McDonald. Yeah. Okay. So first off that, oh, and you know, by the way, you know what the biggest cop killers on the, on the, in the planet is the sovereign citizens who are mostly white. Like, <laughs> so it's interesting that you just went with this 40%. You're quoting some version of 1350 there. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that this is just bad statistics. I can say this is a statistical fact that the average American has one breast and one testicle because you've got 50% women, two breasts, no testicles, 50% men, no breasts, two testicles, average them together. The average American has one breast and one testicle. So there are liars, there are damn liars, and there are statisticians. Um, and, you know, you're listening to a, a damn liar who is misusing statistics. You got it in this one. Coming in from Hake says the NAACP was going to use a different girl, but swapped in Rosa Parks because the other girl was pregnant out of wedlock. And so they're saying that it was a, a setup. I mean, it was a setup in the sense that, yeah, like Rosa Parks was not just some old lady who went in there and was like, oh, I'm just so tired. I have. To. No, this was a particular political action that she took with the intent of of showing that the system was cruel and unfair to black people. And she did a phenomenal job of it. Um, yeah. So, yes, it was a setup, but it was a setup for good reason. And it had a good effect because, again, Think about all of the tired old ladies who actually did just want to sit down that were treated like crap. Next think up, about that. Haig strikes again on the same topic, says Rosa Parks was part of a PR setup, not some spontaneous brave woman. Yeah, I know. I just Gosh. said that. That's why I said she was a trained what? communist. But really? the fact of the matter is. Yeah. But the fact, yeah, Rosa Parks was a Marxist. Yes. But the, the, the fact is, is that again, um, and we said this in the debate, she was still doing a good thing because that law, the forcing black people to sit at the back of the bus was cruel. And it was an example of treating them as inferior second class citizens. So she was absolutely right to do it. That's how political change happens. A lot of the time people think this stuff happens spontaneously. It doesn't. Like, gotcha. And it happens like that on the right and the left. Long nights. YouTube and says, why does this country get mad at BLM for 1% of 99% of protests turning into riots? But January 6 happens and mums the word. I think they're saying nobody does anything or nobody talks about it. They are must be a they say they are protected by the GOP. What do you think of them? Apples? Yeah. Your Nas. Well, I think a lot of them were arrested. So. They're getting their case in court, right? So I'm so sure anymore. there are people. I'm sure there are people in the GOP who don't want to criticize them too hard for electoral purposes. But like the law is taking care of these people. Like they're not being exempt from punishment, right? That's not what I understood. Gotcha. So some of them have been arrested, and it may have been that trying to take over the country, like literally attempting a coup, is the line that white privilege begins to break down at. But we really won't know until like we actually see the trials and see the outcome. Um, yeah, the, I, I will agree with you. Um, there, there was more of a response to this, but I'll tell you what, if that had been a left wing uh, attempt to take over Congress, like, holy crap, there would have been a lot more dead than just one, like four people and only one person actually killed by, uh, the police. Um, you know, the, the, the fact is, is that we just had a violent cult join with a bunch of fascists and try to take over the country for a, um, you know, sundowning uh, old fascist with holes in his brain. So to try to keep him in as the president. And it, it, I would say the level of kit gloves that they're handling does, them with does not even come close to the threat that they posed at that time. Your Nas, since the uh, question was originally for you, I'll give you the last quick and pithy word. And then we got to go to the next one. On the January 6th thing, you mean? Yeah. Oh, I guess it was to him. I thought that was to me. <laughs> yeah, I answered already. I said, like, yeah, some people in the GOP are not criticizing them, but I think, like, law enforcement did take care of them, and they're not going to get away with it, most likely how it looks right now. But, yeah, we have to wait for it. But Next up. I don't have the... They're being uh, punished, yeah. You got it. And Hake says... I think this is for you, Brenton. They say BLM spreads misplaced suspicion and hate. I mean, again, this is the standard kind of red baiting. The idea that you 
that an organization is secretly making up bad stuff about America specifically to cause problems within America as a subversive thing. These problems that they are bringing to light are objectively real. That knee on um, George Floyd's neck, that was objectively real. That happened. Um, the the, the chokehold that killed Eric Garner, the um, uh, the rough ride that killed um, that killed Gray. These are real problems, whether you want to face them or not. I am not a snowflake like you are, and I'm not going to pretend like the world is a, is nicer than it actually is. I'm going to pay attention to these serious problems and them. And that's the only thing that anyone of any amount of intellectual uh, rigor or uh, you know personal um, values can do. Gotcha. So yeah. And get Stanfield. Thanks for your questions. Says thank you for what you do, James. Thank you. Get appreciate your support. Says anytime I can chat live, I'll donate. Human beings need conversations to settle different ways of looking at the world. Thanks so much, Git. That seriously means a lot. And it's true, we're not always here to solve the problem, but maybe we can at least better understand the problem. So thanks for your question. Hake says, Oh, we got, I think I read that one earlier because I was reading some of them out of the order. Yep. And then Heinrich. <laughs> I, I hope Hake, no, seriously, I, I yeah. He's, you know, Hake from, I don't know if you ever watch. I know, Brenton, you're a big fan of Jesse Lee Peterson. So Hake is like the Hake <laughs> Report who partners with Jesse on the, but anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, red, red uh, hair fellow. Yes, but yes, we thank you for your question. Heinrich says, James, this is, uh, this is for support. Great job, but I'll give a sticker for your best insults of Tom's chair. Thank you for your support. I will gladly insult Tom's chair. <laughs> Get Stadfield says also, thank you very much, says regardless of the few conflicts which have transpired within the past few years, would you agree, your Nas, that there does exist some racism? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it exists in the Netherlands. I'm sure it exists in the U.S. Uh, I just don't think the way BLM approached it is the right way. So that's why I'm, I'm taking that approach as a political scientist. So, yeah, there's definitely racism, but I just feel there's more effective ways of battling it. You got it. Thank you very or much. Let's say, let, or let's say more moral ways, because it's not all, only about effectiveness. Just Gotcha. And truthfulness. Bicey Road says, Brent, would black lives be served better teaching how to fight in court rather than the police? So here's the thing. Um, that is also happening. You know, you've got groups like the Lawyers Guild, for instance, and they tend to handle uh, cases like that. Black Lives Matter does not just do the media thing. Like, they're, they also, there's a lot that goes into trial support, and there are other organizations that are more directly focused on that as well. But yes, I, I would agree that overall, when it comes to dealing with police officers, you know, you don't want to meet them with any kind of force, no matter how right you are because you will always lose. Um, you know, I learned that at a very young age, you know? So yes, they need to be battled in court, but even part of court is also the court of public opinion. And that can actually have a direct impact on how these cases turn out. And I think that the, uh, the fact that public opinion was so against Chauvin is a big reason as to why Chauvin was eventually convicted. You know, um, similarly with uh, Cecily McMillan, when she was convicted of her wayward elbow, she only got 90 days instead of seven years. It was because of the media approach to the trial. The people in Occupy made sure that people knew about it, knew what was happening. And there was an unprecedented letter writing campaign. Uh, and so many people sent in letters in support of Cecily that the prosecutor did not feel comfortable recommending what they wanted, which was seven years. So they gave her 90 days. Gotcha. And want to remind you, moderators, thanks so much for all you do. I do want to remind you, moderators, we ask you to refrain from debating the issues. I know that's a new big step that we've made as we want to strive for even more neutrality, but do appreciate that. And then thanks for your question. Bert says, thanks, Brent, for having a goodwill conversation debate towards the end. I don't know if that's towards supposed to... <laughs> it calm down a bit towards the end. I would like to think it was goodwill the whole time. And I, I will say the last time I, I argued this, it was with um, T-Jump. And I think Yanaz has been – I like T-Jump. But I think Yanaz has been very respectful here for the, mo for the most part. And while, you know, tempers did flare at a, at a time, I feel like um, I feel like we got some good stuff done. Juicy. And Reverend Elation. 
said, or revelation, I see what you're doing there. Founder Patricia <laughs> Coolers said that, quote, spirituality is at the center, unquote, of the movement. Do her occult black magic practices help or hurt the movement? I don't know who this person is. I can't say. <laughs> She's one of the founders, right? Patricia yeah. Coolers. And she, what, is she like a pagan or something? I mean, I don't spirituality. Know if she's voodoo. That Maybe she's voodoo. Like the, does she like the earth crystals like you like, Brenton? Is she, I don't do the earth Power crystals. crystals. Dude, I'm a Buddhist. Oh. No, I don't do crystals. Okay. I know it looks like I'm the kind of guy who would do crystals. No, I chant to a Gohan zone. I just like to tease you. I'm so sorry. Anybody out there who likes crystals, um, I just. Snake was right. Thanks for your question. It says if there are poor people. You can reasonably expect crimes if police are getting shot at, not reasonable to fire back, according to Brenton. I would say it depends on how and when and why you're getting shot at. If there's a warning shot, you probably should not be firing back. Again, I think what we need to do in this country is realize that because we imbue cops with so much power, we must also hold cops to a higher standard. Um, and I, I think it is if it comes down to cops accidentally shooting a person or a cop not taking action and getting shot, we should we should more cleave to the latter, because, again, that's sort of what happens when you sign up to be a warrior. You are there to protect people. And, you know, if 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 a cop has to die to protect the public, they should be as a warrior ready to make that sacrifice. Um, and so I think, again, they need to be held to a higher standard. That's the only reason you can ever give someone power is if you hold them to a higher standard as a result of that. Gotcha. And thanks very much for this question coming in from Hake, who says, Cops are more likely to die at the hands of the public compared to the odds of a random black person dying at the hands of police. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know the actual statistics on that. I would have to look into it. But I, I it's, again, I would rather have cops being more likely to die at the hands of the public than to have the public being more likely to die at the hands of cops. Well, I, like, I really think yeah. I really think you're going to have trouble finding any good cops if this is the position. If the position is even if people or criminals are shooting at you, you might still not be able to pull out your gun. You're going to find exactly no one willing to take that job. Well, then there's a lot of cowardly people out there. You no, know? it's not yeah, cowardly. Not, yeah, no. no, no, it absolutely is Come cowardly. On. No, it absolutely is cowardly. Look, if you're a freaking warrior, you need to be prepared to put down your to put to put down your life. Hold on, they're not soldiers. People. They're not soldiers. They're treated, yeah, but they're treated as soldiers, and they, no, they you're perform treating a similar them as soldiers. function. <laughs> you're no, treating them I'm as not the, the freaking David, whatever his name is, who wrote the Killology, is the guy treating them as soldiers and no, telling listen, them you, they're soldiers. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. It's a famous mm -hmm. quote of Ayn Rand. So you have to choose, because if they're soldiers, they're going to kill. So you can't complain about the killing if they're soldiers. You can't be like... Uh, you'll oh, notice I never, like use, I never soldier, use... Dude, I kill. never used the phrase soldier. I used warrior, and I chose that specifically. Because um, what you're I'm... Gonna, what you're going to get technical with me now? Soldier and warrior? Like, yeah. Go on. Um, look, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, is that the state is there to deploy violence and the threat of violence against threats to property. And that is what the police department is. They deploy violence and the threat of violence. If you are someone whose job it is to deploy violence and the threat of violence, you are a warrior. You are not necessarily a soldier in an army, but you're still a warrior. But you want to make them into martyrs. You think they should, I, they no, should, what I want they should to make do, more yeah. risk, even if they're being shot at by criminals. That they is should the, still yeah. think more about the criminal than about their own life. They should think more about the public than about their own life, because this is the thing. You don't. Once again, they are not interacting necessarily with criminals. They're interacting with people that they think might be criminals. But these people are actually members of the public. So what we need to do is make sure that the people that they are interacting with are more protected on average than the people with the guns okay, and the training. But the specific context of someone shooting straight at them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who says it straight at This could just be a citizen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give Brenton like, the last word. I mean, it was just a don't shoot at cops. Yeah, it was just a citizen. And yes, I would agree in general, don't shoot at cops. <laughs> you know, okay. but yeah. like the, the, the point is, is that, again, we, 
yeah, look, it is more dangerous to be a garbage man than to be a police officer. It is more dangerous to be a cab driver than to be a police officer. I think that we cannot afford to have cowardly police officers. Okay, we I, need I'm to gonna, do is we need to I'm have brave must, police officers. We must, we must move to the next one. I know that you've got another round in the chamber ready to fire out your NAS. I appreciate yeah. No, I have to respond to, to, to the danger argument. It's, it's not a correct argument because the danger is of a different sort. If you're working like as a garbage disposal guy and you can get your head stuck in the machine and some people die of that every year, that's something you know is a danger. If you're a cop walking around in a bad neighborhood, you can get shot any second. That is the danger of a different nature than the danger for a guy throwing in the garbage who should have put his head into the machine, right? Yeah, it's okay, so, for, so, so here's what's happening. You're I will blaming give Brent the, the last word, then we must die. go to the next one. And you're just as likely, if and if not more likely, to be, to get killed as a uh, as a as a cab driver. Every fare could come into your your cab and kill you. Should cab drivers get a license to kill? No. Next you know? up, well, they should be able to defend the themselves. One. Thank you Everyone's guys. Everyone's able to defend themselves. Guys, sorry, but we have so many questions. I just want to get through these, and I also want to respect your guys' time. I know you guys are busy. Cab drivers and don't have qualified immunity. This one coming in from yeah. Long Nights. I agree with you on that. Long Nights YouTube and says Ronald Green was tortured by twelve. And he didn't deserve any of that, Yernaz. There are thousands of cases of these. As a black man from this country, BLM is completely necessary, and I can speak for the majority. Okay. Again, if there are thousands of cases, and the best you can provide me is Michael Brown, you're doing something wrong. You're I mean, making you just it provided worse. you with another one. one sec. Like Michael Brown. But, no, no, yeah, I mean, I but I'm not going that. against this case. Like, I haven't studied this case, but I'm not going against it. If it's true what this guy says, please run with this story because this is a real good one. And I don't see the lies as yet. But yeah, why pick the ones with the lies? Like, that's, I don't get it. Like, yeah. if they're all around, pick the good ones. And I won't have a complaint. If, if, if I'm it's not, so clear. See, again, I don't believe you when you say that. <laughs> um, like, I believe you're sincere. But again, yeah. also, you know, you, you say you watch a lot of Young Turks or whatever, but really Definitely. keep in mind all of the big Black Lives Matter cases that are going to get um, elevated by the right wing media are ones that the right wing media knows they can find and poke holes in and make it look like crap, you know. Um, so you're, what you are seeing is curated in a way. And then also your brain then is selecting them more often anyway, because what is that um, uh, self-serving bias that we all have? So, you know, you may just not pick up on stuff that doesn't enforce your worldview your otherwise. And that, that's all of us, but, you know, we should be aware of it. The question was originally for you, you're not. So I'll give you this uh, last word and then we get over to the next one. Well, like, uh, of course he didn't deserve it if what is being said is true and I wouldn't go against it. And it's just an evidence that there are good cases to attach onto. And that's my advice. And if I think if BLM would do that more than they are right now, they would be a better organization, like more moral, more truthful. They wouldn't be boxed in and they shouldn't be able to, they shouldn't have to lie about Makia Bryant because they were truthful from the get-go. Gotcha. And Cider Report says, Brenton, Heather McDonald is someone who did a Prigger U video and unironically brought up 1350 as her primary argument. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. I'm glad that, yeah, she's worthless to listen to. <laughs> Long Thank Nights you YouTube says the commission for January 6th was spiked by the GOP though. Yeah, it definitely was spiked by the GOP. And you'll, you'll notice this wasn't a for lot you. of the people. This who... is to challenge oh. your nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but listen, I already said, I agree that there are people in the GOP who have electoral uh, reasons not to go all out against the January 6th people. I'm saying that as long as how I understand it, people are being prosecuted and are being jailed for what happened. So to me, at least that part seems legit. Gotcha. And Sleepy Dan says BLM also spread COVID during their protesting in the pandemic. I mean, that was something that I was actually really concerned about, which is one of the reasons why I didn't attend any protests uh, over the summer my wife is high risk and I wasn't going to risk that. Um, I don't know how serious the um, uh, COVID spread from the protests was because it was outside and most of the protesters were masked. Um, but, you know, I, I, that's definitely a trade-off because, again, you've got one 
epidemic that is COVID. And then you have the epidemic of, um, you know, uh, police brutality, uh, police murders, and um, the ongoing, um, you know, criminalization of the black community uh, for for profit prisons. So cost benefit analysis, I don't like the idea that anybody should be in the streets spreading COVID. um, But I can see why someone might feel that they needed to take that risk to deal with a much bigger problem. Gotcha. This juicy one from Hake from the Hake report says, how is it lying with statistics to acknowledge that black Americans are much more likely to perhaps to, to be perpetrators against police and people in general? Yeah. So again, it's lying with statistics because it removes it from the uh, context and also it's not people in general. So when you talk about like the 1350 or the other race related statistics, what's happened is, is that you have prevented a fact, you've presented a fact, but you presented a fact with absolutely no context. And as a result, people will draw an incorrect conclusion and inference from it. So you are essentially using the truth to tell lies. Gotcha. In much the same way that if I said, yeah, average American has one breast and one testicle, I would be using the truth to tell an obvious lie. Want to remind you folks, oh yeah, it's coming This coming Wednesday, as you see at the bottom right of your screen, JF will be taking on Lance from the Serfs on capitalism versus socialism. You don't want to miss that one, folks, so do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so you can see that juicy debate that's going down this coming Wednesday. And we also have two more debates today, you guys. This is the most epic 12-hour debate stream of your lives, and we want to say thank you so much to Brenton and to Yernaz for helping make it possible Thank you guys so much. And folks, they're linked in the description. So if you want to hear more, you can hear more from these guys. But thank you, Brenton and Yernas. It's been a true pleasure. I'm going to be back. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. I'm going to be back in just a moment, folks, as we will be in the intermission. Namely, we have the next debate coming up in about a half hour. And so I will be back in just a moment to chat with you in the old live chat, let you know about channel updates and upcoming debates. And then we'll be starting that next debate coming up in about 30 minutes or so. So thanks so much and stick around folks. I'll be right back. And thanks so much again to our guests.